So the end of the, the program as well, we've got a, a lucky draw item, ladies and gents. Very important that you be there because the winner must be present. And we've got a... It's a nice CD MP3 player sponsored by University of Johannesburg. And uh, you'll be able to win that. Right. Great, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome at the 7th of March Transport Forum. Um, today we're talking about the role of transport in the fourth industrial revolution, 7th of March 2019. It's great seeing all of you here. We've been privileged in being hosted by Dr. Nalin Pisa and her team, and also supported by Joe Prof. Jackie Walters for many years, making this possible, and it's such a great privilege to be hosted by University of Johannesburg for so many years. So thank you very much for your kind support. Um, yeah, let me do this. Obviously the events are all for free, so we need companies to support us to, to make it possible, catering the venues and so on, all our operational cost. Um, so we'd like to give recognition to our sponsors um, Dr. Pisa is going to tell us more about the University of Johannesburg, our host for today. We've also got Oricon, it's a consulting engineering company. I don't know if there's perhaps somebody from Oricon who wants to come and say a few words quickly. They're usually shy and they don't want to come to the front, but okay. Oricon has been now the fourth year gold sponsor with the Transport Forum, consulting engineers, ladies and gents. We've got VIX Technology, Chart, you want to say a few words? Thank you, Chart. Morning, um, it's uh, it's Todd Kruger. Um, I'm the CEO of VIX South Africa, and just in short, um, VIX is a global company represented in South Africa as well, with a fixed investment in South Africa. We have got 700 employees across 38 offices across the world. Um, we have a local office, and uh, we employ 70 people in South Africa, specialise in AFC, public transport, and also RTPI. Um, our flagship, obviously, projects that we run that are known is My City Down in Cape Town, Go Durban from a BRT perspective, as well as uh, Arieng in Swanee, 
We also play in the bus subsidy market where we supply payment solutions and fare collection solutions. Um, also looking good in terms of the monitoring side where we actually do a fantastic subsidized monitoring project for the Department of Limpopo for transport for Limpopo for the province monitoring their subsidies. Yep, and uh, let me leave it to the people that's prepared for their speeches today. Cheers. Thank you, Chart, CEO from VIX. Um, we've got C-Track. C-Track's been a sponsor for the transport portal since the very start, 12 years ago. Where's Ray? Or whoever from C-Track? Not coming to say that, Ray. You're right. Ladies and gents, it's all about making your assets visible, fleet management solutions, and making sure that you know where your, what your goods are. We've got Railways Africa magazine. Uh, ladies and gents, all about rail infrastructure. Philippa Fox and the team has been gold sponsor now for three years. You should actually subscribe to Railways Africa. Very valuable information. We've got the WITS Transnet Center of Systems Engineering. Nick? Good morning, everybody. My name is Nick Lutie Hopkins. I'm from the WITS Transnet Center of Systems Engineering. Um, WITS, a little university across the road. I think that's correct. Um, and um, what we are is a wholly sponsored center by Transnet at the university specializing in systems engineering and demand planning. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Third year now they're being a gold sponsor. We've got Brand Source, Jody Haken team. Um, Jody not here yet. I don't think so. She was up me earlier on a car got stuck, so she's actually seeking a lift here, uh, some car troubles, but Jody is actually excellent in communication. Um, so first year being a gold sponsor, and then we've got Kalula Work. Where's Dawn? Dawn, don't you want to come and say a few words? Where's Dawn? I just see now. Not today. Kalula Work, excellent packages, ladies and gents, making business travel easier. Go and find uh, the links on our, on, uh, on our Transport Forum website. You'll also see these business cards and pamphlets uh, making business uh, more viable, easier, and so on, business travel. So Kalula's their first year. They've been a gold sponsor with the Transport Forum. So it's great having them around as well. And we've got event streaming. It's Paul Opel sitting at the front. They're doing the event streaming for the Transport Forum. So if you need event streaming, and ladies and gentlemen, professionally done, They've done even event streaming for Walt Disney in the U.S. for four years. Um, very professional and very reasonable pricing. They work through the transport forums. You also have, uh, support the transport forum should you use, make use of their services. So um, if you need event streaming for your events, uh, you can contact me and I'll bring you into contact with event streaming. So let's give the sponsors a big hand. So without further ado, I would like to, to introduce you to our host for the day, Dr. Nolene Pisa. She's the head of the department for the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Man Management of University of Johannesburg. Thank you very much, Nolene. Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's session uh, and to welcome you to the University of Johannesburg. Uh, the University of Johannesburg is at the forefront of keeping up with strides in the fourth industrial revolution. As you are aware, the fourth industrial revolution is unavoidable, unavoidable uh, and as a result, as instit educational institutions and businesses uh, strides have to be made to maintain and survive this industrial revolution. Uh, the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management uh, trains over 5,500 students in the fields of transport and supply chain management. Our qualifications range from diplomas uh, right up to PhDs in both transport and supply chain management. Uh, 
Um, our department is making strides in remaining relevant uh, in the industry and keeping up in, with the developments in the fourth industrial revolution, particularly by ensuring that our education offerings are made for 2019 and going forward. We have in place advanced diplomas that are being offered online, fully online, to ensure that our outreach uh, is Africa as well as global to in, uh, maintain um, the competitive edge that we have in training. In addition, our department collaborates with various local and international partners uh, in terms of research uh, and uh, various research projects to maintain um, our niche in cutting edge research. Um, today's topic is very topical and the host of speakers that have been lined up are going to provide us insights as to how various sectors in the South African industry uh, related to transport and supply chain management are keeping abreast of the developments and utilizing um, their competencies to remain competitive. As, an as a pessimist of technology and the fourth industrial revolution, I always ask myself, is South Africa ready? Is Africa ready? We have so many challenges uh, that need to be addressed and that we are lagging behind. But I think like with the first, second and third industrial revolution, um, time will tell and recent evidence is showing that the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution are likely going to outweigh the threats that they pose. And as much as we are faced with uh, increasing unemployment and then widening inequality gap, the fourth industrial revolution is going to present opportunities uh, for South Africa to catch up and remain relevant in the world economy. Opportunities will cut across areas such as accessibility. And as much as urbanization and globalization is increasing populations in urban areas, technology and the fourth industrial revolution is continuously providing opportunities for people to have better accessibilities through new appro approaches to transportation, such as ride sharing, as well as drone deliveries. These are all technologies that are easing congestions or will hopefully ease congestion in the roads and improve efficiency and delivery of goods and services and people. Uh, furthermore, technology hopefully will help us to achieve better security and better access on roads by changing human behavior. Surveillance on roads will inadvertently change human behavior. Imagine if people are aware that they're being monitored, their, their cameras accessing their human uh, decisions they make daily on the roads. With the taxi drivers still driving the yellow lanes, knowing that they are accountable, they are actually being captured and can be traced down and are made accountable. Will other drivers who are impatient uh, driving the yellow line Again, these are all prospects that inadvertently, in as much as they present threats, they are presenting opportunities for improvements uh, in accessibility. Access to education will definitely improve as more and more people will have access to education. Online education will create opportunities for people to access qualifications, particularly in the field of transport and supply chain management. The skills gap continues to widen the skills that are required today um, by businesses, and particularly the skills that are required in the future, the gap continues to widen. The World Economic Forum highlights that uh, some of the operational and tactical uh, jobs in the field will become obsolete in the future. But if we are able to keep up with these developments and offer timely training that equips the workforce with the skills required for the future, then the trajectory for growth for South Africa and Africa will only be positive and we are able to keep up and uh, make the gains um, that we require for sustained economic development. However, a few things have to be taken into account. Digital skills, as I've alluded to, will need to be um, developed quickly and to be maintained to ensure that the workforce is continuously reskilled to keep up with the demands of the changing business environment. There's also opportunities presented by the digital economy. In as much as the digital disruption will create an imbalance, South Africa has an opportunity to rebalance and reevaluate its resources and direct it to take advantage of this new vast market that's being created by the digital disruption. Uh, also, 
there will be opportunity for more public-private partnerships as we are aware that government resources and the fiscal continues to be burdened with uh, inefficiencies in the economy, but the private sector has an opportunity to play a more increasingly important role in investing in new systems and infrastructure that can help to maintain the competitiveness of companies and the economy at large. But luckily, we have a lot of experts that we have invited that will provide you more detail into some of these uh, topics that I've alluded to and will help us to understand and keep abreast of the developments that are happening, particularly in transportation uh, in our economy and how they are coping with the fourth industrial revolution. Welcome again, and uh, I hope that you will find the day's presentations very uh, informative and you will continue to support the Transport Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Norlin, and it's a privilege being here. Um, I think in this specific venue, it's about eight years we've been having a transport forum, more well, nine years maybe already. So it's great always being here. Thank you very much for that. Um, ladies and gents, our first uh, presenter then for the day is uh, Mr. Tommy Sneiman. And he's the Southern Africa Enterprise Business Department, Southern Africa Region, Huawei. He's an ITS specialist, Intelligent Transport Systems. Um, we know Tommy for many years in the industry. It's great having you here, Tommy. We've been looking forward to your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he's an international speaker on ITS and also international representative. So thank you very much, Tommy. So he's going to talk about the digital transport for transformation to smart transportation. Um, they're also going to host the Transport Forum of the 16th of May. So great, Tommy. Thank you for your support. We just need to go set, uh, set up Tommy's equipment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Harry. I just want to
Well, the busy setting up there, ladies and gents. Um, just now we're going to hand out feedback forms. So we'll circulate through the audience. Uh, really appreciate your, your feedback uh, to make the, the events more successful. Um, and then um, the lucky draw, don't stress about that. We're going to send around a box later on and today where you can put in your business card uh, for the lucky draw. Since you not have a business card, then you remove the paper from the plastic here and you can put that in the box. Uh, but I'll, I'll educate you later on. Um, yeah. They, what's happening here at the front is that um, obviously the technology not only, not only needs to talk to the screen here in the auditorium, but also needs to talk to the streaming to the world out there. And it's just a challenge to get the settings done, uh, especially with Tommy's uh, presentation. He can't share with us, so we need to use Tommy's present, uh, uh, um, equipment. But we'll get it sorted out in a moment. So those of you who haven't noticed yet, who came in later on, your arm rest of your seat, you can bend down and you can bring up a little table and you can use it to, to fill in your feedback form. I also want to inform you while we're waiting next week's transport forum, there's an uh, event next week, 14th of March, in, at the Pretoria Hotel in Mitrand. And it's all about um, road funding, feedback from the operators. Um, you might have remembered that uh, we're doing four events. It's a series of four events sponsored by ETC, which is Electronic Toll Collect. They do the, the, the toll collect for Sunroll. But they, they're being really um, optimistic and objective about this to obtain that public's feedback or opinion how roads should be funded in South Africa. And the sessions are moderated by Mike Schussler, the well-known economist. Um, he's moderating the session. He's doing an excellent job. Um, and uh, uh, we unfortunately uh, promoted this event quite late this, this time, next week's event. So on this stage, we're earning about 40 bookings. So there's a lot of seats open. And we urge you to actually come and attend this event, uh, make your booking, uh, it's definitely going to be a very interesting event. We've got the Road Freight Association presenting. We've got CSIR and the Road Transport Management System presenting. We've got logistics players presenting on road funding. Uh, we've got uh, Margaret Wolf. Uh, you know her. She's very you know, well known for Mercury Freight um, and so on. So it's going to be a very interesting event. Um, and that's the, the third in a series of four. The last event will be hosted on the 18th of April. Also, um, the event on the 4th of April will be hosted in Durban by Transnet. Um, it's about collaboration and integration in the ports. Um, the host for the day is the chief executive of Transnet Port Terminals. But the presenters on the panel are people from Transnet Port Terminals, Transnet National Ports Authorities, Transnet Engineering, and Transnet Group. Um, um, and Transnet Freight Rail. All of them are on the panel of the 4th of April in Durban. So the event's already been published. You might have noticed the email that went out the past today saying two great events worth your while. Go and have a look there. You'll see this Transnet event had been, had been published in that email. So make your bookings quickly. I know that event again will be fully booked soon. Um, the event will be hosted most probably in a beachfront hotel in Durban. We're just waiting for final confirmation uh, from the procurement division of Transnet, which venue they're going to use. But the event will take place on the 4th of April.
you for the opportunity where this day originates from. He's from a couple of years in Zambia. Prof. Jackie and I was attending a conference on the airport companies and I presented on how should a airport of it, uh, the future look like. And Prof. Jackie said to me that we will have a day like this to talk about the fourth industrial revolution and therefore thank you for, for the time. Uh, now Harry said to me, he limited me to 20 minutes. I negotiated another five minutes for the video and uh, rem reminds me of Harry when people greet, and I'm not sure if everybody knows exactly why people greet this way. Hello, how are you? Fine with me. So I'm going to do introduction. I'm going to talk about what is happening on the industry side and then what is the impact on transportation. So from Huawei side, and Chad mentioned how big VIX is, Huawei, 180,000 people in the world, Chinese company, in each country we have our local companies registered. And uh, Prof. Jackie was asking me this morning how many people on research we've got. We've got 80,000 people just doing research in China and in the UK. We are in 170 plus countries and our turnover by the end of December 2018 was over 100 billion US dollar. So we are number 72 in the Fortune Global 500 companies. Now if you look at where we originate from, well we originate from the carrier systems 30 years ago and we are providing 60% of all carrier equipment to all the telcos. And then we started with the consumer business, the cell phones, which we are number two in the world. Uh, we overtook Apple. And uh, then we are on the enterprise side. The enterprise side, that is where I'm focusing on. And that is where we're looking at data centers, we're looking at artificial intelligence, we're looking at storage, we're looking at devices, and all the components that work very closely with the carrier and the consumer business. Then we've got a cloud, which is a very new uh, business division. And at cloud, we will go into it more detail later on. When we started with the Industrial Revolution, it started in, in Britain. And uh, the first Industrial Revolution was about mechanizations, 18th to 19th century. We look at the railroads, steam was generated, locomotives were started with steam, uh, steam power on ships. And then we moved to the second Industrial Revolution which is between 1817 and 1914, which is electrification and mass production, telegraphs, start of telecommunications. Then we move to automation. Automation was a, a very well adopted industry. When you look at the adoption of that industry, we talked about digitalization, that's why we called it digital, digital, digital revolution. Now a lot of people are saying digital is only part of the fourth industrial revolution, but we have to make sure that we understand that we are already digital. A lot of technologies is digital. A lot of computing power is there. There's a lot of information out there, but we are not talking about the fourth industrial re revolution yet. Um, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, then we're talking about the intelligent collaborative industries, augmented reality. We are talking about something different than the, the third industrial revolution. A lot of people are saying that we are still in a second industrial revolution. I had a discussion the other day on CIOs and the one person was actually consulting to one of the biggest rail companies in South Africa and we had a huge discussion about where are we. Now first of all they said that not everybody in South Africa has got electricity already. Therefore, we cannot talk about that we moved on to the third and the fourth industrial revolution. And I said, that that's incorrect. We are already in the fourth industrial revolution. We are already doing certain things in the fourth industrial revolution. So we cannot say due to the fact that everybody don't have certain things in the second industrial revolution that we are still in the second industrial revolution. Now, what is the difference between the, the first three revolutions and the fourth one? 
The first three is all about the advancement in technology. Everybody innovative, coming with new technology, coming with computers, coming with smartphones, coming with uh, PCs, data, data warehousing. But what is different to the fourth is that it's all about communication and connectivity. How do we take this data that we've got? Now, most of the municipalities, there's people from municipalities here, there's people from government. Most of them are already digital, but digital in a silo way, digital in a component. If I look at ITS, Advanced Public Transport Management Systems, Automated Fair Collection Systems, that is digital, but what are we using it for going forward? And therefore, it's very important that we look at that how do we move to the next level of smart transport. I wanted to compare it with the body. If you look at his body, and when we're getting older, and Harry was saying he's got gout, and I was just thinking, maybe somewhere in that toe there's some gout in that, what is happening in his body? So we are saying the existing ICT systems cannot support the development of future-oriented smart transportation. So first of all, data awareness. Now this morning I had a very good experience again trying to get into Empire Road early this morning and everybody is standing in the intersection. Exactly what Nalene was saying. Nobody thinks about when a robot goes to red. One of points, traffic section information missing. So we don't have this information. I had the opportunity in January to go and visit Shenzhen's transport authority. Now when you move into China, Shenzhen, Dongguan, any of these places, you will not get a car standing in the intersection. There's no car that will stand in the section because they will be fined. There's cameras in each intersection. Now, if you look at the transport authority, they're managing over a million cameras. 60,000 fixed cameras of intersections. The rest are all in vehicles. Now, Nalene started the discussion by saying, what about vehicles? All public transport in Shenzhen, city of Shenzhen, if you're a taxi, if you're a del delivery van, or you're a bus, or a rail, you will have cameras on your car or on your vehicle. Taxis got three cameras in each vehicle. They get monitored. So, for instance, if you are a high danger driver of, or a driver driving around with high danger stuff in your vehicle, you'll be on a hit list. And they will monitor your behavior in the car or in the vehicle to see that is your eyes all the time on the road? Are you obeying to the traffic rules and all that? And they've got a hit list of 10 every month, which they take off and they suspend your license. So that's how they manage traffic and how they manage it. So it comes back to what are we doing about traffic session information. It can be done. It's very important. So that is the neuron of the body. When you look at the body itself, comprehensive management and control, what we're sitting with is fragmented and passive response, no proactive, no integrated management, no control. I had the opportunity to sit with Jack van der Merwe yesterday. We're talking about what is the impact of the Gauteng Transport Authority Act that's coming into play in a few, a week or two or months' time. And he said, but how do we manage all the data? He wants to have one transport model that he wants to use for all the municipalities. Ecorilini is using one model, Jobex is using another one, Swan is using another one. How do you get all these into, into uh, one platform. It's all about integrated management control. Then we look at emotion. The most important, the commuter, the person, the customer feeling, uh, the lack of personal personalized services, information services. Last is the brain, the decision making part, the lack of data convergence. Is our data interoperable? Is our data available? And I'm going to talk, say, real bias information. Is that available for the rest of the city? Is that information available for the provincial government? How do we make sure? And that's why the technology that we've got 
is not there yet uh, deployed, but we can go to that way. So if you look at the innovative ICT, fueling digital transformation of a transport industry, then we look at travel services, mobile access, multimodal transportation, end-to-end -end visual, uh, visualization, green transportation, low carbon travel, smart products, emergency management. And I just want to come back to the green transportation. Most of the taxis running in Shenzhen are electrical cars. How do we reduce it in South Africa? How do we implement electrical cars for our taxis that is running about 200, 300,000 taxis on the road? Just imagine if we can reduce that amount of combustion. Infrastructure, real-time detection, cloud-based. Only way we can do this is if we, act, we have to look at the big data side. Big data is very important. Cloud computing, IoT and mobility. That is the platform for fourth industrial revolution. Not switches, not servers, but those concepts. How do we make sure that the data, that we've got a big data, we can mine that data? How can we share that data? How can we make sure that people who are responsible, and I just had a discussion now with, with Jackie and he said, but you've got access to data. And I thought to myself, yes, everybody's got data. In the Transport Authority in Sension, they've got two years data of intersections. So they can do predictive uh, timing of an intersection to say, this year, this time, there was this problem. Therefore, today you will have this problem. So you start moving towards predictive management of intersections, and you can actually control it. So you make a better decisions. Cloud computing. Last year, CETA rolled out a cloud, a private cloud. They're moving towards providing the services to municipalities. So the municipalities don't spend millions and millions of rands on infrastructure. Rather rent the space from, from, from CETA. IoT. We are talking about billions of devices that we are going to look at. How do we manage IoT devices? How do we make sure that any IoT device that is connected to any application that is managed. And then mobility. Everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody wants to have access to information. How do we make sure that that information is accessible? So we are entering an intelligent world. And what does it mean? All things sensing. So IoT devices, any device get connected and you can have access to information. Temperature, space, sense of smell, hearing, vision. All things are connected, so that is part of the fourth industrial revolution. Mind of connected, uh, ambiguous connections, wide connections, multiple connections, and then all things intelligent. Now our founder from Huawei site says, everybody's already digital, but he wants everybody to become intelligent. How do we get to that next level? Artificial intelligence is coming some time already, but how do we transform the industry and how do we transform the transport industry to become artificial intelligent ready? First of all, is about the computing power, uh, the data center, the cloud investments, how reliable that information, and I want to give my own definition about smart. Now smart, seamless, mobile, accessible, real-time technology and must be a reliable technology. To be ready, you need to have algorithms, you need to have that information, and you have to have labeled data. So that's the three components to be uh, artificial talent ready. When you have AI and industry, you can generate additional ecosystems. By means of ecosystems, you can start looking at public entities, education, healthcare, insurance, and how do you bring all this together? The nice buzzword in a market, and I think Harry mentioned in May, we're going to talk about smart cities and how transport fits into smart cities. Then it's all about artificial intelligence. How do we bring all these different areas in a city? 
I looked at a requirement from City of Johannesburg. There's 13 departments, and all of them got standalone type of databases. But how do we bring all this information into one? I worked for Ecoleni. We had 127 databases, all combined into 27 databases, all due to artificial intelligence. The last slide I want to share is about connectivity, computing, and cloud. You must have connectivity. We were in a discussion where Harry was involved as well with MEC Vardy, and he said we must talk about uh, autonomous vehicles. Where are we? Can we do autonomous vehicles? Are we ready for autonomous vehicles? And the main thing is, no, we're not ready. We need 5G network, of which we are we busy implementing in South Africa, 5G networks. And I said to MEC Vardy, we are not ready yet. Because while some of our places, we don't even have 4G networks. We don't even have a stable 3G network. How do you expect to get our uh, autonomous vehicles and we, don't, we cannot support 5G? Nice to have, but yes. So connectivity becomes very important. How stable is your connectivity? How stable is your network? Do we have optic fiber? Do we have wi uh, wireless? Do we have radio equipment? Do we have microwave systems? How stable it is. On the other side, the cloud. And to do that, you need to have a monetization of your technologies, which must be an open platform, must be an intelligent platform, and must be secure. If you have this in place, then you can move forward to the next level of the industrial revolution. When we presented in Zambia, we had quite a lot of time to talk about this. How does the future of uh, the new airports look like? Where are we moving towards? What is the, the look like of a new smart airport, smart aviation? And I managed to get this video when we attended training in, in China in January about Hamad International Airport in Qatar. Now, everybody was saying, and the discussion point was, but this is just a dream of how the airport should look like. Nowhere in the world it is happening. But I want to share today, and that is the end of my presentation, um, version two will be in May, where we're gonna talk more about the building blocks towards smart transportation. So this is just a high level overview of what we need and what we require. But enjoy this video and then thank you very much.
That is the future of the airport. So Jackie is not a dream. That is, that is happening. Thank you so much, Tommy. Very interesting. And we're really looking forward also to being hosted by Huawei on the 16th of May. Thank you very much. Ladies and gents, uh, while we're setting up Liesl, because we have to swap equipment as well, uh, we're going to have some very interesting news from a student association. So let's listen what they have to tell us. Greetings to all. Um, I go by the name of Lisolons in Tsunambi. <coughs> I am a student at UJ. I'm currently studying transport management here at APB. And I'm here to inform you more about TALSA. So TALSA is basically um, it stands for Transport and um, Logistics Student Association. And um, it was formed in Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, my name is Liesl Brickhart. I'm the head of business intelligence for ComAir. And um, really what my role is in the company is all around data. And to refer to what Tommy was saying earlier, you really can't 
do the fourth industrial revela uh, revelation, <laughs> revolution with our data. So um, what we do um, from a data perspective is it's scan it includes everything. So it is obtaining the data from whatever sources it is, structured, unstructured, um, importing it or consuming it in the data warehouse, creating the data sources that we then give to our business intelligence community. We um, implement the business intelligence tools, we train them on it, and we help them to design the reports that the business then use to actually make intelligent decisions. So I am going to talk about data a little bit um, later on. Um, and now I'm going to do exactly what Tommy did. <laughs> I promise I didn't copy you. Um, so really, just quickly, um, first industrial revolution was all about fully harnessing the power of steam. The second one is mass production um, through electricity. And the third is the digital revolution, which is just an onslaught of technology. Now, the fourth industrial tech, um, revolution really is where we're using the technology of the third to change the world we live in. And how it is um, more radical is that we are actually re-engineering our worlds and our lives and what we do by using the very atoms of what we are. So, for example, um, your biohacking, we're changing DNA. Material hacking, we are creating designer materials that we will use in building new aircraft that can fly higher. Um, spacecraft, even the food we eat. I'm, I must say I don't like that one very much. Um, the clothes we wear, um, the vehicles that we build, all of that is happening. And um, what it's called is the factory of the future or a smart factory. And the technologies in there is very much what Tommy also said. It's your artificial intelligence, your machine learning, your um, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology. It's a whole host. And that is always changing. I think that is the characteristic of the fourth industrial revolution. It is don't ever get comfortable. It is changing all the time. But I actually had a conversation with a colleague of mine this morning. The place where you grow the most is where you are the most uncomfortable. And I think the fourth industrial revolution does that to people. It makes you uncomfortable. And um, especially in the aviation industry. Because historically, we really are all about safety and being sure of what you're dealing with. So what the, um, the fun, not the fun factory, the smart factory brings um, has been implemented in most industries across the world now. So GPS navigation, your speech recognition, handwriting recognition, virtual reality, augmented reality, IoT, it's, been, it's going on everywhere. It's not coming, it is actually here. People are using, or companies are using it, but the, aviation industry has, because of it being deeply rooted in safety, it really ha has uh, for years seen any innovation as a potential risk. So, um, I mean, one of the things, I, I often watch air crash investigation, and the only reason why I do watch it is because I know if you watch to the end of that program, they show you how they are using what happened in that crash to make sure your next flight is safer. So everything of the fourth industrial revolution flies in the face of that. But it is now being um, used in aviation. We have to, we have to keep up with it. Otherwise, we will become irrelevant. And you think planes can't become irrelevant? It can. There's different ways of doing things. So I've got about 20 minutes. So I've chosen four topics that I'm going to go through for you. So single pilot planes. So it's coming. So you'll see that I'm not going to the far edge of this. I'm not going to pilot free planes. Okay, so Steve Nordland um, at Boeing um, confirmed that they are heavily involved in the um, piloting of the single pilot planes. They do not foresee their 737 passenger planes flying without pilots in the near future. They've put that on the cards. It's not happy. Oh, it's not happening. Um, but they are very much um, planning for the single pilot planes. Now, some people are not happy with that. Um, Sully Sullenberger, um, the pilot who is now um, heading up the um, aircraft safety for the FAA, or FAA yeah, um, he said it flies directly in the face of everything we've learned about um, air aircraft safety. However, what Boeing is saying is that they are using the technology in the fourth industrial revolution to make sure that the cockpit is more aided. So if you think of what happens in a cockpit, you've got your captain and your first officer, and they're constantly double-checking each other. There's this buddy system going on all the time. There is no reason if you 
for, for, you not, or for it not to be possible with a single pilot if you build your cockpit in a smart way and that it can aid a pilot. But you are going to, because it's the aviation industry, people are a bit concerned. Um, I think the change may take a little bit longer, but they are testing it on cargo planes at the moment. So if they're not hitting the passenger jets, they are testing it on the cargo planes. So the next one is IoT. So this is really all about being connected. Again, Tommy, referring to what you were saying, with a connected um, airport, for us it's a um, connected airline. So there's no reason that as a company we have to work in silos. We can really connect all our divisions by using the data at, um, at our disposal. It doesn't always have to be through streaming. Some of it is simply just having the data in a data warehouse, but breaking down the silos between the divisions and sharing the data so that you can um, get the information from each other. So um, I think it's Chris Raspin from IBM said that we are using less than 10% of the aircraft data in, um, available in the world. And I think it is also because there is so much data when you um, take it off an aircraft. Some of the long hauls, you take one terabyte of data off that aircraft on a single flight. So it, it, it produces a whole host of other issues that you're dealing with. But what they are working on at the moment is um, this scenario. And, it's, and if you think about the data available to us, it's completely possible, and it's probably in the next three years, is you, you have your aircraft, um, you've got the data available, you're in an area where you've got good connectivity. So it's in a um, country that can easily do 5G streaming. So you, let's say you've got a flight between London and Sydney. You've got a stopover in Singapore. The pilot is happily flying possibly on his own, and he's seeing the uh, marker coming up in the cockpit to say there's something wrong with the fuel pump. What he can then immediately see is the go to the engineering maintenance data to see how old this fuel pump is, and he can see there's about 10 flights left in it, so he'll know this is not critical, so he doesn't have to panic about it, but he knows that they can now change this from a maintenance perspective, they can replace it. So what he'll do then is go into the stock to see in Singapore, do they have that available? If it's available, they can stream the engineering team in Singapore and say, we're coming in, we can't be late for the next flight, please get an engineer airside and change the fuel pump. And they can, through that, make sure that the on-time departure of the second flight isn't impacted. And that is, that is really what's possible, and it's all with your um, IoT. Next one is hypersonic. So Boeing unveiled their plans in June last year to show, to show how they are working on this at the moment. So this plane will fly at Mach 5, which is five times the speed of sound. They will fly at 90,000 feet, which is three times higher than today. We fly at 34,000, and at the speed of 3,900 miles per hour. So what that means is that you can fly from London to New York in just over two hours. So that's fantastic, but it brings a whole lot of other considerations because suddenly, for me personally, if my kid has a recital back in London that night, I won't stay in a hotel. I'll go back the same day. So what does that do to the hotel industry? And I think that's also things that we need to just think of. There's immense opportunity with, um, with all the um, technology, but you always have to think of what the implications are. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but it just means that there are implications and you do need to think of that. So what Boeing is saying is the three things that they're really um, working on at the moment is firstly, the actual propulsion needed to fly at that speed, the considerations um, that they have to take in terms of the cabin experience for people, human beings being in a cock, oh, not a cockpit, in a cabin at that height and flying at that speed. What do you have to change for it actually to be a pleasant experience? And then thirdly is the materials. So what is the design and materials that they are going to have to put in place to make sure that you can fly at that speed and at that height? But again, it's happening. This one's really exciting, Uber Air. So um, six years ago, we all thought, oh, no, no, car rental companies aren't going anywhere. Um, they won't be impacted. It's impacted. You fly to Cape Town 9, you go to the CCC, you take an Uber, it's the easiest thing to get there. You don't have to sign anything, you just go. So things that you thought's not happening is actually closer than you think. And I really like their strap line, it's closer than you think. So they've got a team called um, Uber Elevate. They are now working on Uber Air, 
It is aimed for 2023 for launch in Dallas, and it will start as, well, it will be a ride sharing, so it's not just on your own. It has to have at least four people. And um, they're going to start with inter, uh, or between suburbs and then intercity, but it's going to Dallas in 2023. And um, what they will use is uh, they will use rooftops of high buildings, and the aircraft they're planning to use is called VTOL, which is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. I just want to show you a quick um, video. in Sandton. I work at ORT. I hate traffic. I have to go through the Lulies every single day. I'm always late for my kids' homework. I'd use it. I'd, I'd get home probably 20 minutes earlier. So these things are going to change our lives. Will it have an impact? Yes, absolutely. Maybe not immediately on aviation because you still need the bigger aircraft transporting more people, but it will change it in pockets. Okay, so the future. So the fourth industrial revolution is definitely, well, is fundamentally going to change the way that we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we educate our kids, um, and also, obviously, the way we travel. But I think also the way we dream. If I look at my kids, they have almost no limit in terms of what they think is possible. It's very different to, I'm 44. When I was a kid, you, you grew up with limits. You, you maybe didn't know you had limits, but nowadays there are no limits. The kids, you know, you, you ask them something, can this be done? Yeah, sure, let me just ask Google. They, they you know, things can, can be done. Um, we'll, we'll educate our kids differently. I mean, I'm in a university now, so I can't, I probably shouldn't comment, but I think universities are gonna have to change. We can't train people just for becoming a something because that something might not exist. So we need to give them skills to be doing many things. You need to train them or, or educate them on logical thinking, on um, negotiation skills, on project management. You definitely need to train them on being agile, being able to do things in small sprints because we, the world wants um, results much faster. People don't want to wait for things anymore. So, for, so the future is exciting, but it's very much under construction. Um, we don't have, uh, not in my view, the World Economic Forum is looking at it, but I don't see that there's a huge body really looking at the pace of innovation. Um, it is by far outpacing the consideration that we are giving the impact of this innovation. It's, going, it's really quick um, and things are happening on the fly. Um, which is good, 
Um, but you do need to give um, things a bit of um, consideration. I'm thinking of my, um, the difference between myself and my kids, for example. So I love writing. I doodle. It's how I remember that I wrote something on a particular page when I met with a supplier. Or I can quickly go back to it. My 10-year-old son, he's never seen an encyclopedia in his life. He only knows Google. And often when he asks me something and I don't know, which is happening more and more, he says, don't worry, Mom, I'll ask Google. My six-year-old, uh, and my, my the 10-year-old, he obviously types and he gets his answer. My six-year-old is not interested in typing whatsoever. He only talks to Google. I often hear him saying, hello, oh, hi, Google. Hey, Google. And then he asks the question. So it's fantastic. So they're learning. But the, the problem or the, the consideration that I have is twofold is we, we do need to look at the safety around things. I sat next to him luck, luckily one day when he asked Google how baby chickens are made. Google didn't hear chickens. So suddenly I had to grab uh, his tablet away from him. He's got a tablet at six. And I had to uninstall YouTube. I installed um, Kids YouTube, and we asked the question again. And YouTube, our Kids YouTube came back and said, please ask another question. So there are ways. You have to consider it or consider how to do things. There are ways to do things, but we have to consider things. I think also if I look at the millennials that I work with now, um, and the same with my kids, and my, my youngest, it, they, they don't get technology in the week at all but they do on weekends. So we've had to change from five gig to 10 gig. We're now on 20 gig in the house. So you, things change. I mean, we're approaching uncapped, I think. But um, every weekend he wants a new game. And then I'll ask him, why? But you got one last weekend. No, 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 I want something new. And that is the new thing. There is instant gratification in everything um, that they want, and they want it now. And this is the people entering our workspace. So how are we going to manage that? It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just you need to be aware of, of what's coming. So responsible innovation. Okay, then I'm going to talk about data, which really is my passion. Um, data in terms of, uh, well, the world, but um, aviation is a huge thing. Um, this is actually, uh, this is why I brought my stick to, um, to Harry um, because it's different than the one, the presentation I had yesterday. On Thursday last week, we received our first Boeing Max 8 aircraft, the first one in Southern Africa. And um, last night, we um, downloaded our first batch of data. So we're now going to be doing this twice a day, where usually we had to wait two weeks for our other engineering supplier to get the data. We're downloading it off the aircraft now twice a day, which means that I can give the business aircraft data much faster. So the world is changing. This is how big it is in the background. Here is just how you connect the, um, the, um, the laptop, um, which is called the PMD, to get that data off. So the data is, it's a lot of data. So the considerations that we now have is when you get one terabyte of data, do you really want all of it? You don't want all of it. But because the world is changing all the time and the questions that I'm going to get from the engineers next month will, will need data I haven't given them. So you need to give consideration in terms of how you store that data, take what you need, but then have agile um, processes in place or store it in a way that you can, from an agile perspective, go and get what you need later. Also, from a data storage perspective, where do you save it? This is um, quite, well, it's important data, but uh, you need to decide which data sets do you store where. Is it on-premise, is it on, in the cloud, or is it on a private cloud? And then the security of it. Obviously, you've got loads of regulations. Where do you store it, and what is the accessibility? But it's all very exciting. Um, we use Tableau from a business intelligence perspective. You really can use any tool it's, but because it's all about the data that sits behind it. But we quite enjoy Tableau. Um, so we, um, the business intelligence community and the company create the dashboards for the business to look at. And we build it in such a way that people can um, interact with it. So you can filter it, you can download it. If you've got the right rights, you can actually go and change that dashboard because we're really trying to create that... Um, feeling of user friendliness that people are, and, and self-service that they can change it. But what Tableau has done recently is they've used, um, they've started using natural language processing, which allows you to actually ask questions of your data in a way that you would ask in Google. So you'll open a, um, a dashboard or a storyboard and instead of filtering and clicking, it's got a little search bar like Google and you can type in it. 
to say, okay, I want to know um, what is the average um, fuel burn on a Max 8? What was it in March? So you can go and ask it instead of knowing where to click. And what that does for me in terms of users is that I can even put more people on Tableau because it's easier to use. They know Google, they know the methodology so they can use that. So I just want to show you um, a quick video on that. You need answers? Ask your data. No, seriously, just ask your data. It's pretty easy, really. And everyone can do it. He can ask it to help find new opportunities. Or he can ask it to check out the competition. You can ask pretty much anything. Okay, not that. Well, maybe that. She can ask it to evaluate market positioning. And he can ask it to help figure out if it's going to be a great vintage. You can even ask it how to bring in the professionals. So, any questions? Ask Data. Answers for everyone. From Tableau. So for me, I, I met with Tableau last month, and I said to him, if you can do that, then you can do voice. Imagine if you can, like my six-year-old, look at the data and actually speak to it and ask it, because you can. You can, put, you can download an audio API, and you can actually ask those questions. So really, the sky is the limit for me. Here we go. Thank you very much. Liesl, I think, ladies and gents, it's such an interesting world we're living in today. So thank you very much for coming here, for sharing your knowledge with us, and Dawn also for supporting the Toronto Forum. It's Kalula and British Airways, operated by Comair, and they fly myself when I present this. Kalula, thank you very much. Ladies and gents, we're going to a break for, for lunch now. And uh, before we do that, I just want to see, are there anybody in the audience participating at the Cape August Cycle Tour this year? Any keen cyclists? Any cyclist? Okay, so if the cyclists can come and see me here, please. I might have a little gift for you. All cyclists, come and see me here. Ray, please come and see me. All right, I'd like to see you. So I'll see you back here at 20 past one. Thank you very much.
food. It reminds me of that story. The other day I told the story as well. This guy talking about his wife. He says, yeah, you know, I only take my wife to a place three times. The first time is to introduce her. <coughs> the second time is to apologize. You know, really, I'm sorry, guys. You know. And the third time is to return the stolen goods. Right, we live. Ladies and gents, welcome back at the afternoon session. It's all about the role of transport in the, in the fourth industrial revolution, 7th of March 2019. Um, our next presenter for this afternoon is Mr. Marcus Balright. He's the managing director of Kuna and Nagel. And he's going to talk to us about our digital journey, obviously, of Kuna and Nagel. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Harry. And um, it's just a pity that I have the slot right after lunch, yeah, where everyone is a bit tired. Yeah, so I try to spice up my presentation a bit, even though we have seen most of the exciting parts already before, right? The airplanes and uh, the Uber fly uh, story and so on. So I want to share probably a bit more hands-on digital experience, what is happening right now in Kuninagel, but also in South Africa, in the shipping industry in the logistics industry. So I want to outline our journey for, for a little bit and, and show you what's real, what's happening now and what benefit creates or, or digital tools can actually create for the customer because this is at the end what counts, yeah? The voice of the customer and creating value for them. Um, some of you may not know, know Kuno Nagel, yeah? Because we are largely invisible. But yeah, no, it's true. Right? We are asset light provider, so we don't own any truck, we don't own a warehouse, we don't own a vessel, no airplane. We just invest our money and funding into people and systems. But yet, we are the largest sea freight forwarder in the world. Number two in air freight, with some staggering numbers, which I don't even want to go through. The key is that we have been around for like 130 years. Yeah, and now we're present in all countries of the world with 80,000 people and so on and so on. Yeah, but the key is actually how to survive for 130 years. And even more exciting, if you look at South Africa, we're having our 65th birthday this year in South Africa. So how to survive and develop and grow in South Africa for 65 years. And that is not by standing still and doing the, way, uh, the things the way you have always done them. Right? This is, as we have heard before, making smart decisions, evolve around your customer needs, and be very quick and agile in the market. And this is what it actually boils down to. Yeah? So e equally in South Africa, I think we are number one in sea freight uh, volumes, import-exports, what we're managing. Um, I guess we're also import-export combined in the top three of air freight as well. And um, that gives us a good, fair understanding of the market. I want to kick off the, the digital journey, as I said, at the, on the customer side. So what is happening yeah, on the customer side? Because that drives everything, the consumer behavior. And we all know it, right? You order your food, you order your taxi, you order the ingredients to cook, you order the food but then pick it up in the shopping center or in the supermarket. Yeah, I mean, there's endless variations, but it all boils down to you want it now, anytime, anywhere. You want it now, right? People staying up at night, yeah, whenever there's a Black Friday shopping or Cyber Monday and whatever it is. Yeah? 12 o'clock sharp, they are there. They want to buy that gadget for, for a very low price. That's an immense challenge for us as a logistics company, but for anyone involved in that supply chain. That Anytime, anywhere is driving a lot, of a lot of people crazy on all ends. But if we are not ready from a technology side, all systems will fail, right? And we've seen that if major um, e-commerce players, even like a take a lot, collapse under the big volumes on these major, major peak days, which from a logistics point of view are an absolute nightmare. Right? You have the whole year, you have volumes like this, and then you have one day, you have volumes like this. And still the customer expects a delivery within 24 hours, 48 hours, and so on and so on. So 
it's not possible if it's not digital, it's not possible if it's not automated. And we as a service provider need to go along with digital solutions, otherwise we are phased out and we can't be around in the next 65 years or 130 years for that matter. So how do we adapt? We came up with a digitalization roadmap for the company because we want to stay relevant. We want to be around in another 20 years even. And there's a major concern. And everyone has that same concern, whether it's a shipping line, an airline. Yeah? And we have seen companies which were once very, very big just disappearing. With these new players, an Airbnb, an Uber, these people coming up like out of the blue and capturing the whole market in like five years. Yeah, so you better stay on top of your game, focus on your customer, and make it very, very easy to deal with you and do business with you. No headaches, right? That's what people want. Instant gratification. You want to order and you want to order it now, and you don't want it to take a lot homepage is down. Gives you a headache. You're disappointed, you're not coming back. You go to another platform if there would be another one. Yeah? So that is very important and that is driving us 24-7 data availability, sales availability, and what we call e-touch, which is automation. I have uh, prepared just a few samples, very hands-on samples of digitization in the freight space, yeah, which are very real and um, happening. And they all circulate around the three topics, customer, technology, people, which is actually our strategy for the next five years, which is called KNXGen. Gen. So on the customer side, it should be literally a red carpet from whenever you start interacting with us, but to be honest, for any company in the logistics and transport space. So the red carpet, right? Easy to find you, easy to get a quote, easy to open an account, easy to have a first trial shipment, no headache coordinating that shipment, the pickup, um, the tracking, the delivery, the invoicing. It must be seamless. That's the expectation from customers nowadays. And if it's seamless, they actually don't want to hear about it. It boils down to exception management. But then they want to hear before it actually happens. Right? So you need to predict there's a disruption in the chain and need to tell them in advance. But if everything goes smooth as normal, no one wants to hear about it. And this is what you need to adapt. And this is what we're trying to ensure with a very seamless and digital customer experience. And I will come to this in a minute. On the technology side, and that is largely inward facing, yeah? So we automate processes, we offshore uh, tasks to, to, to other uh, service centers and we automate as much as possible, yeah? Even invoicing and all that, all of it. And on the people dimension, digitalization has a large impact because to a large degree our workforce are millennials, right? You have heard that uh, expression that millennials they're extremely digital driven. This instant gratification, they're looking for purpose, they're looking for challenges, they don't look for a title, they don't look for money so much, right? They don't want to be intellectual stimulated. So what we have created is actually a digital platform called MyKN. It's literally a link in a Facebook, a Skype, uh, a WeChat, a WebEx, um, Outlook, um, Calendar, all together in one tool. And if you like phishing, you tag yourself with phishing and you will connect with another KN employee, Kunenaga employee, in Canada, in Alaska, and you can start sharing knowledge about phishing. If you servicing a particular client, let's say Volkswagen, you do it here, you do it in Germany, you do it in Australia, you group, you collaborate around the customer Volkswagen, you share the challenges you may have with the emission scandal in Europe, which led to a shortage of engines, huge disruption in the supply chain, and the consequence was a lot of air freight. So you collaborate across companies, boundaries, countries, time zone, in a virtual space, in a digital space, for the benefit of the customer. Remember, that's the key, customer centricity, to make it happen and to create value. So. Yes, it is towards the customer internally to create efficiencies, but also on the people side to keep them engaged and um, at the end a, a happy employee is a productive employee, right? So let me show you three samples 
the first one, and uh, I had a session one and a half years ago uh, where I outlined some of these tools already. So they have more matured. I, I just want to start with one platform which we have. It's called Kane Login. Kunanagel has an advantage, I have to say, we have one system globally. Every country, every operator is in one system. So we have this massive data pool, this massive data lake we can tap into. So the minute something happens somewhere in China, the container is late in an inland terminal or in a port, the customer in South Africa knows it immediately. That's already good, right? And there are alerts around it, and we can then change the, the departure port if you want to, to still catch another service. Uh, all the documents are uploaded, like the bill of ladings, and so on and so on, and automated report. So it's a very powerful tool, but that was actually developed already 30 years ago. Of course, it has evolved now. It's on a standard which is uh, uh, breathtaking, yeah, especially when it comes to order management or PO management and so on. But that has started 30 years ago. But then evolution accelerated very fast, right? There was no smartphone like 15 years ago. Yeah? And now without smartphone, no one can live anymore. Right? There was no Uber in South Africa like, what, seven years ago. And now everyone heavily relies on it, depends on it even. So FreightNet, for example, which is a tool that gives you an instant quote and an instant booking capability for freight. It's literally like an Expedia for freight. Yeah? So you go on Expedia or on Emirates or Travel Start or whatever it is, and search for a flight ticket. Yeah? from Durban into whatever, London, what are my options? Lead time, price, and then you make your booking. Now that's happening for the freight, for air freight, for LCL, for FCL. It's all there, it's happening. So we have it in our portfolio. And it is an end-to-end -end rate, door-to-door. -door, yeah? We were first in the industry, that tool is only two years old. In the meantime, most of the forwarders have such a tool. So it's accelerating very quickly. Right? So from that platform, it took like 30 years. Now that's like two years. Yeah? And now everyone has it. So we're accelerating. Second very powerful um, example is what we call the Sea Explorer. And that is now really big, big data. Right? So if we ship close to 5 million containers every year, we know what's happening. We know the world trade. We know how steel exports out of China develop, maize imports into Africa. We know which shipping line is always late from Shanghai to Durban and the reasons why and the average delay. So that's a very, very powerful data lake. And now we, we commercialize this big data in one way that we're actually selling it as an early economic indicator to banks. Yeah? It's a digital product, it's a data product. Who would have thought as a forwarder actually selling is data to banks and make money out of it? We do. But on a more practical note, we use this 63,000 port pairs and 2 million data sets per day to actually find the best schedule for our customers for, let's say, their Asia retail imports into South Africa, show them exactly what kind of services are available, a realistic lead time, and a reliability index. So shipping line A, let's say Immersk out of Shanghai, always on time. MSC out of Shanghai into Durban, average three days late. Okay, fine. I go with, let's say, option one. It's not real. I'm eh? just making it up now. So <laughs> I'm not, not promoting the shipping lines. Yeah? <laughs> so, um, but then, of course, then you need the price attached to it, right? Some people may, may be even okay with a slower lead time or unreliable carrier if they can save $200 a box. Possible. But now at least you have the whole data on your fingertips to make the decision, an informed decision based on the average lead time and so on and so on. Where it gets really interesting is when we look into the future then. So we see this rear, uh, rear view mirror, right? In average, an MSC out of Shanghai into Durban is three days late. Okay, fine. But now my particular shipment is on that container vessel, and I actually want to know, will it be on time for my store opening or not? So we have created a bit predictability index out of it, and it predicts the ETA of the container in Durban. Taking the vessel location into account, the average speed, the, the weather en route, is there a hurricane or anything, is there port congestion, is there any news about a strike in Durban, and so on and so on. 
And then it gives an early indicator, a warning, a pre-alert saying like, okay, how we read the situation and where we see where the vessel is currently in the middle of the Indian Ocean and the weather condition and the speed, that will be two days late. Okay, very powerful, right? And then the retailer, so to speak, or the customer in South Africa can make a decision. Okay, what are my, my alternatives here? Do I put a small amount of uh, cargo or items maybe in an air freight uh, shipment and fly it over quickly? Do I wait? Do I postpone my store opening? What do I do? If you don't know and you only find out until the, the vessel arrives three days late in Durban, it's too late already, right? The flyers are printed, yeah, people queuing outside of the store, too late. So that is a very powerful tool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one single platform, sh shows it very, very transparent and gives you actually all the information to make a, a, a decision which service to use across all carriers, by the way, and it even shows you some very helpful information, CO2 emission on that service. Yeah, If you're a company which has a very much focus on um, green initiatives, for example, even shows you the, the capacity on the vessel for reefers, yeah, also very important for our South African clients, especially in the, in the perishable and reefer field. So very, very powerful tool. But this is where, where we're going, right? Soon there will be a Expedia for Freight, where you then see a Maersk, a Kuhnenagel, a DHL, whatsoever. You see them all, and you pick potentially across shipping lines, across four borders, the, w the best in terms of lead time and cost. Yeah? So platforms. Cane trade. Brand new, um, don't want to reveal too much because we're probably coming out only in, uh, in a few weeks. But that again is addressing a need in South Africa or a headache of the importers of actually getting finally the landed cost right, which is a big, big headache and which leads at the end to quite high pricing in, in the retail sector if you compare this globally, right? And why is that so? Obviously, the rand is very volatile. SARS regulations are complex. The lead time of supply chain is very long, right? It takes four weeks for a container to arrive from China. In the meantime, the rand did like this, yeah, or this, or this, whatever, right? SARS may have changed, tax and duties, yeah? working capital. Most of the importers don't have that money on hand, so they actually want to sell the goods first before they actually pay the goods. So there's a need for trade finance. And where it all comes together is a very single platform which we are launching in a few weeks where the small and medium-sized importer without a logistics department, without a treasury function, can actually automatically calculate the landed costing of the item, can even click or decide I want to pay only after 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. So then the price of the item is recalculated. If it's still viable to bring that product in and to sell it into the market, book, and then the order basically is locked with the factory in China, with the transportation provider, documents given to the customs clearance department, the forex is hatched, and the funding is covered by a bank in the background. How cool is that? Yeah. So an instant landed costing um, booking and trade finance uh, platform, uh, which I'm personally very excited about because we see a big challenge in the retail industry or actually in, in the whole importer space of getting landed costs right, and actually also accessing finance for that matter, trade finance. Yeah? Costs are very, very high. So I also want to just give an outlook from probably my personal point of view. So we have heard a lot earlier, right? Internet of things and so on and so on. But for us, what's most relevant is the impact on trade. Yeah? Because that's our business, right? Facilitating trade. So. What will shape trade on our digital journey, on all of our digital journeys? It's probably cross-border e-commerce. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully convinced. And each of you maybe have tried to order from Amazon, from Alibaba, and the headaches with it. Lead times, costs, customs, and du uh, customs tax duties out of the blue and so on and so on. It's a headache. It's really a headache, but there's a big chance. Also, if we see that the African free trade agreement is getting closer, closer to becoming effective. Yeah? So that, for me, is a big, big topic. FinTech mobile payments, 
that goes along with it, right? because we will have people on their mobile phones ordering stuff and need to be able to pay without kind of credit cards or ETF, and it's happening. Tools are there, but the share is rapidly increasing. Yeah, you just look at China, just been there last week. It's absolutely amazing, absolutely mind-boggling what's happening in that, in that space. And I would say we are maybe like 10 years behind, but it's coming, it's coming fast. Partner integration, it's all about platforms, right? You, you, you see that, you know, Facebook and WhatsApp want to integrate and, you know, all is integrated. You log in with one and they know you already, right? It's all connected. So the same for shopping, same for trade. It's happening. Artificial intelligence, right? This is the prediction of it. Prediction of prices, yeah? Commodity trade. Prediction, how is the sugar price developing and the impact on transportation? It goes very quick nowadays, yeah? This automation and data is, is huge complex and it's getting bigger and bigger by the day. You have heard one terabyte out of one long haul flight. Crazy. How to keep that simple and to focus on maybe the few KPIs or the few data sets which really matter. So we need smart people yeah, to manage all that. Data is the new currency. I mean, we all know it, right? We saw that coming like five years ago when you want to excise a, uh, or ex um, you want to uh, access a website and you need to put your email address and your telephone number in. But then it's for free, so you feel like, cool, okay, I give away my telephone number. But then you start receiving SMS around funeral covers, yeah? <laughs> Not that old yet, yeah? So anyway, um, data is very, very important, yeah? So you get a lot of free if you give up your privacy, basically. Yeah, and it's, just, it's all what we're doing, right? We're selling our data in terms of global trade flows and so on. In Africa, usually, you know, in Asia, they call it tiger, tiger countries, yeah? So there's no tiger in Africa, right? So lion, yeah? The lion's still a bit sleeping. Africa Free Trade Agreement, 1.3 billion people, youngest population, and half of the workforce in a few years globally will be African. Opportunities are massive. That will shape trade, right? The moment everyone looks at basically North trade, North Asia, North Europe, or Europe, North America. But South, largely not on the map yet, but it's coming. Asia, Africa, big ties, right? China, Africa, trade agreements signed, big investments, it's coming up. Yeah? So it is really indeed the century of Africa. I read the stats uh, on the flight back from, from, from Asia last week. The next 10 years, there will be more construction happening in Africa than the last 100 years combined. Can you imagine? And the impact on trade, on shipping, on infrastructure, on Durban port. <laughs> 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 yeah? you, see, you see the stacks of containers here, yeah? So quite full, not moving. Okay. Um, Okay, how, how, how do we want to tackle that? And that's, very, that's my last slide. Yeah, very simple. The people need to be very agile, very strong, innovative, embrace change. Yeah? Evolve along the challenges, evolve alongside the customers. Be the leaders in automation innovation. Otherwise, you're, you're just still operating with Excel files and you know, I feel sorry about these guys, actually. <laughs> right? Focus on the customers, but then do, do what matters to the country. So we just received our BE level one status, for example. Right? We are 30% black female owned. That's good, tick in the box, yes, very important. We are 65 years, and all of the above will help us to stay relevant another 65 years. Our focus is entirely on Asia this year, and we want to help to facilitate trade into Africa. So these are the topics which are on my desk currently, yeah? to stay on top of the trends, to stay on top of macroeconomic uh, developments, but also to stay relevant in the next 20 years. And at the end, customers will drive us into the direction they want, and we need to go along. Yeah? So that is our take on uh, digitalization, our journey over the last couple of, of years, and, and the tools we have developed. And at the end, it boils down to execution. Yeah? So we make it happen. You should as well. And again, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, ladies and gents, clearly a company to keep the eye on. Lots of innovation. 
it's uh, nice to hear about um, artificial intelligence and automation, but also about simplicity. So my mind is difficult to get there, but clearly you guys know what you're doing. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. His colleague will join the panel with us. Thank you, Marcus. Great, ladies and gents. Um, I was quite relieved to see Mr. Tony Willis walking into the room just now. So, Tony, can you please come to the front so long? I really appreciate that. He's our next presenter, so just quickly need to set up. Good afternoon, everybody, and sorry for the uh, late rush into the room. It's been a bit of a crazy week, and uh, today wasn't any better. But uh, I, th I see one of my colleagues here. I'm not sure if there are others floating around in the room. But uh, so, Candice, if I say anything I shouldn't say, please just tell me. Um, so, Harry asked me to um, present today on some of the action plans that Transnet has, um, and they, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution and, and digital business and 4.0, uh, but I think they, in the greater scheme of things, the necessities to actually take Transnet and the country and assist in taking the country's transport and logistics environment into a next generation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Transnet and its mandate. So I'm not sure if everybody, if I went around the room and asked, what is Transnet's mandate? Can anybody tell me? Um, do you know that we actually have a shareholder compact with the DPE? All right, so we've got five strategic objectives that we actually need to uh, meet on an annual basis um, as part of our contract with um, the Department for Public Enterprises. The customers that we have, and just talking a little bit about our customer experience, and specifically in the context of 4.0 and the need for a change to customer centricity. Um, I think it's important that we maybe share some of our dirty laundry um, and sort of talk about what needs to change as a result of that, and that's certainly part of our action plan going forwards. Sorry, and then um, the impact of digital, um, I the last speaker, I think, did quite a nice job of introducing some of those uh, ideas and how they can be utilized. And then just talking about some of the key initiatives that we have um, on the board and on the table. And unfortunately, I can't necessarily share everything. Um, but what I would like to do is maybe leave a couple of minutes at the end for questions if you have. Um, Harry, I don't know if that's allowed. Um, we'll see how much time is left. Otherwise, we'll take it into the discussion panel afterwards or the panel discussion. So, 
if we look at the mandate that we have, and it's, there's two parts to the mandate. One of the, is the mandate as a state-owned enterprise. And while you'll see some phrases there that may not make sense in terms of what's in the press and uh, is associated with a number of state-owned enterprises, um, we are actually financially self-sustaining, right? I think we're probably one of the few state-owned enterprises that are. We've maintained and continue to maintain that. Um, so we are one of the few state-owned organizations that do not go looking for bailout, looking for handout on an annual basis. In fact, the, I mean, it, it, the last year, so last year, last financial year was probably the most, um, was the best financial year ever in transit's history. So in terms of are we actually liquid? Are we actually able to exist? Are we actually able to fulfill part of our state-owned enterprise mandate? Absolutely, we do. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Um, and I think you know, most organizations probably would argue that they're in a similar space. But certainly, if you look at what we are required to do, we're required to be custodians of a large part of network infrastructure. And when I talk about network infrastructure, the freight and logistics network infrastructure of the, of the country. So we have that custodianship that we've been given as part of our mandate. At the same point in time, we need to make sure that that is kept up and running, it's made available, it's reliable. So we need to make sure that all of those things are done as part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have part of our business that's regulated and part of our business that's not regulated. And so we've actually got quite a different and complex mandate in terms of what we have to do. Some of what we can do, we can charge market-related price. Some of the things that we do, we can't charge market-related price. It's completely regulated. And Ports Authority is, is one of those examples. We're expecting to see some of that happen in the rail space as well, with rail regulation coming in and taking over in the, in the foreseeable future. And at the end of the day, we've got five key areas that the shareholder compact with the DPE actually requires us to actually adhere to. And the first one is to reduce the total cost of logistics as a percentage of transportable GDP in the country. So it's actually our obligation to lower as far as possible the cost of transport and logistics in the country for those services that we provide. In addition to that, we are actually specifically requested and mandated to move from road to rail, to move the amount of traffic from road to rail. That's part of our mandate. In addition, we are expected to leverage private sector in bringing the extension of infrastructure into what we currently have and what we are currently asked to, to be custodians of. We're required to integrate South Africa with the rest of the world, both regionally and globally. And at the same point in time, given all of the above, we're also expected to optimize the social and economic impact on the country. So we've actually got a hugely multifaceted set of expectations that's been put on us, not even by our customers, but by the people that we actually report into. So if that's the case, what do our customers think about us? Well, unfortunately, our customers don't think historically that much about us. Our customers have actually, over the period 2015 to 2017, actually thought that we need to do a whole lot better. Right? So our net promoter score is the difference between people that actually don't think Transnet's doing what it should do against those that think we are doing. And we've actually got a significantly negative score there, and that negative score has actually increased over the period 2015, 16, 17. We're starting to see some of that turn around, so if we, if we, and we are expecting the 2018 numbers to show a slight difference and a, sh a slight improvement there, but that was the story over the last three years, 2015 to 17. What's also interesting is we look at our customer satisfaction scores. We've actually got 
a net satisfaction score of also minus. So if we look at that dissatisfied customers and loyal customers, there's roughly 54% difference between those. Having said that, everybody's got a negative score in the space. So ours just happens to be a little bit worse than, the, than some of our competitors, but roll, road hauliers are also on a negative satisfaction score from a customer perspective. What does this actually tell us? What, is, what this tells me is that actually from an overall logistics service provider and transport and logistics services provision, we need to up the game as a country. Right? No matter whether you're Transnet, road hauliers, or anybody else, right? other logistics service providers are just in the negative space as anybody else, we need to up the game. What our customers are asking for at the end of the day is a combination of really basic stuff. So can you communicate with me better, please? Right? Can you improve my time to delivery? Right? Can you make sure that available capacity is there when I want it? Right? Some of the basic things that we would expect just to be delivered by anybody in terms of doing business. But at the same point in time, there are certain things here that are not that easy. So be open to negotiation, all right? maybe logical, be transparent. All right? we, want, we need to create levels of visibility across the supply chain. And coming back to, again, the previous, the previous presenter, we need to be able to provide that in order to make the customer experience better. And in order to put all of the necessary solutions in place to solve the problems, to be able to meet the mandate of our shareholder, as well as to improve what our customers are asking for, we've actually got a set of action plans that we've started putting in place. I'm not going to go through this one in detail, maybe just flick through to, to this slide, which is why is where we are now different? All right? And again, I think the previous pre presenter talked to some of that. There are three key differences between the fourth industrial revolution and the previous industrial revolutions. The first one is time. Right? The timeline in terms of what is possible is becoming more and more fast, it's actually decreasing in terms of how fast I can actually deliver anything. So previous industrial revolutions lasted for hundreds of years, right? hundreds, 50. The current revolution is such that the technologies that are coming are coming faster, right? and the impact of what they are doing is that much faster. So time is a fundamental change between previous industrial revolutions and today. The other one is the number and range of technologies. And we'll get to a slide on that just now. But if, effectively, if you take, go back to around about 2013, so only five, six years ago, right, we had what Gartner called the nexus of forces, right, which was social media, big data, mobile, and cloud. So suddenly, out of nowhere, we suddenly had these four things that hit us in terms of what technology was possible. Then, within two to three years, we had 3D printing, we had blockchain, we had um, drones, we had a whole lot of analytics capabilities that came on top of that. So suddenly, we've got now eight technologies, and now you add a whole lot to that, you add 5G to that, and the range of technologies that are now coming at us in one fell swoop, in one tsunami effectively, is vastly different to anything else that has happened ever. So previously we had one or two technologies that came in as part of an, an industrial revolution change. Now we've got anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 different technologies with completely different capabilities that are all coming in and providing a, a potential change at the same point in time. And then the, the other difference is the ability of consumers to collaborate, right? The previous industrial revolution, right, we didn't have email, right? We, didn't, we probably only just had fax, but we probably didn't even have fax at the beginning of the, um, the third industrial revolution. So the ability for people to communicate and the speed with which they could communicate was completely different. We didn't have cell phones. 
So it wasn't possible to actually send a WhatsApp picture or to tweet or to communicate with people all around the world. And so the third change that's significantly different is that the ability is there for people to collaborate, right, and to communicate with each other very easily and very quickly. What that says on top of the, the change is there are six key areas that drive out the fourth industrial revolution, particularly digital business. The one is demand becoming personal. So historically, and a large number of businesses did this for a large amount of time, a company would define a product and they would try and get you to sell the product, uh, sorry, to buy the product. They would want you to buy that, that product from them. The change now is now I've actually got to define the product to meet the customer need. And the customer will then buy that product from me. So it's very much a customized product or service offering that is the change. I can't any longer, I cannot in the, in the fourth industrial revolution world expect customers to buy what I want them to buy. Right? I have to give them and offer them what they are looking for to meet their business need. And that's a significant change. And you'll start, you know, we've seen for the last five years or so, companies like Amazon and Google um, and eBay actually playing that exact changed role. It's not that they provide something and we have to go and, and, and buy it or use it or subscribe to it. They are providing services that we are actually looking for at the end of the day. So that's a key change. And that will talk to the customer centricity conversation that, that I'll come to in a couple of minutes. Um, products become information rich, and again, the previous speaker talked to that. The data reliance deepens. And again, as we go through in the next couple of minutes, um, we'll talk about the dependence on data and the need for, without data, the inability to actually provide next levels of service and capability in the fourth industrial revolution world. Um, the role of machines becomes more important. The boundaries blur between industries and certainly as an organization, we're starting to see a, a boundary blur. You know, we historically have been focused on very much siloed, rail, terminals, pipeline services that we provide to, to our customers. What we're now starting to see is, is a blurring of those boundaries where we now start to potentially play as a 4PL or 5PL as opposed to a 2PL historically. And then, as I talked about, everything accelerates. So, some of the fundamental pr principles behind what we're doing is really to make it easier for customers to interact with transit. At the end of the day, that is it, right? That's the most fundamental change that is actually happening inside of our organization today. It may sound trivial, right? It's not. And it's got significant knock-on effect in terms of what it actually means as we go forward. I'm going to leave the rest of that, and you will have access to this, um, to the slide. So I'm not going to go through everything point for point. But a couple of fundamental changes to Transnet, right? What are our action plans look like? Number one is implementing a new corporate center. The corporate center model that we've had for the last 10, 15 plus years is expensive, it's top heavy, it's bureaucratic. We have to change those behaviors. And part of what we're looking to bring in to change that and drop the total cost of delivering services to our customers is by implementing a new corporate center model. So that will be part of what you'll start to see coming out in the press and in, in uh, notifications over the next while, is the change from a corporate center perspective and the change to how corporate center and the businesses that make up Transnet actually fit together. The idea at the end of the day is to become smaller, leaner, and to add value, right? If the corporate center is not doing that, then it shouldn't be there. And that's one of the, or some of the key principles that we bring to the party. The other one is leveraging analytics for operational visibility. And this is a busy slide, but at the end of the day, historically, we've been able to find out what happened, and sometimes our customers found out what happened before we did. All right? When, where, how, why, and what do 
we do about it? But the questions beyond that, we've actually never got to in terms of systems and solutions that we've, we have in place. We haven't integrated data from various different components of the transnet stable to say, if I want to get an end-to-end -end view of what happened from a pit to the time that something hit a, a ship and what did that look like, right? We don't have that visibility today. We're busy building that visibility and the concept is very much a strategic and intelligent smart center. So the idea is to, to have the ability to define operational visibility end to end, so to be able to get a view as to what's happening across all of the transit business from start to finish at any point in time, to be able to make tactical decisions because when something doesn't go right or when I end up with a typhoon about to hit Turban Port tomorrow and we've got 150k an hour wind, what do I actually do? Right? What changes do I make to my day-to-day -day operations to make sure people are safe, to make sure that the containers, the people are safe, that I don't have cranes blowing into harbors, etc. So those are real things that happen. And so the tactical decision making and de deviation management is important. And then the last part is strategic. So at what point does Transnet decide to move from traditional fuel to solar? as an energy source inside of any port. The same thing for, for rail. So those are some of the questions, and those questions need to be answered by a total intelligence center. So part of what we're building out from an action plan perspective is an intelligence center that spans strategic, tactical, and operational visibility end to end across the organization and everything that it does. One of the things that we're also looking to do, and coming back to the customer-centric customer view, is we are changing how we deal with our customers. Historically, a customer has had to potentially go to rail, to ports, to ports authority, to get something from a pit to leaving a harbor inside of Durban. So three phone calls, three conversations, three contracts, that changes. So Probably the biggest change that we're bringing in over the next six to 12 months is a change to end-to-end -end services. So you will only have to make one call. You make one call for whatever the service is that you require, and that is how we will actually operate going forwards. That means consolidation and lots of change to our current structure, but at the end of the day, it's about the customer and what the customer actually requires and asks for. So a massive change from a customer centricity perspective and a massive push behind customer centricity from Transnet as a whole. In terms of the, the other technologies, in, inside of the intelligence center is the necessity to actually build digital twin capability. We cannot in the future world be building physical infrastructure to test, right? The time and the knock-on effect and the effectiveness of building physical infrastructure in order to get learnings is passed. So one of the biggest efforts that we, we want to bring in as part of our action plans is the building of digital twin. So digital twin being a technological or virtual replica with all of the characteristics that go with that to actually simulate what is physically on the ground or physically existing. So, for example, if I want to test how a, um, the, the birthing change, if I dig a, a deeper berth in East London Harbour, right, instead of going and physically doing tests on there, I build a computer simulation model that actually reflects exactly how the ships that are coming into the harbour can work and not work with different levels of the harbor actually being dug out underneath. So instead of having to do, go and do physical work, I build simulation models to make that happen. That becomes part of our future and a far bigger part of our future than we ever had before. Blockchain is another significant initiative. So blockchain provides that immutable ledger of transactions that have happened over a period of time. There is no physical update of any record I either have a new record or I don't have a record at all. 
So the point here is in order to ensure that there is end-to-end -end, um, security, end-to-end -end trust in the value chain and the data that's being stored across the board with any of the end-to-end -end logistics transactions that we do, we see blockchain as a key technology to provide that level of trust to our customers and to, to other people as well. Part of that brings in the idea of smart contracts. So we will start to see smart contracts leveraging a blockchain platform that start to come out of our action plans and out of our initiatives over the next while. At the end of the day, what does this actually end up? It ends up with a world that is faster, a world that is smaller, more automated and digital, more integrated, more reliable, more trustworthy, more virtual, more accurate, and based on data. So at the end of the day, we end up in a world where we hopefully, as a result of some of the initiatives that we're building out, deliver services that customers are actually looking for. We provide end-to-end -end data and end-to-end -end visibility for transactions that customers are doing with us. And we do that in a timely fashion, which allows our customers to make decisions that actually allow their business to be optimized as far as possible. Through some of the other initiatives, such as the corporate center change, we end up dropping the cost of business, and we therefore end up dropping the cost of services that you actually contract from us at the end of the day. So we've hopefully resolved and are busy resolving some of our customer pain points. We are also looking to extend partnerships with the private sector, and that could, could uh, include somebody coming and saying, I want to please build a rail line between these two points, right? We're busy structuring ourselves in order to enable that to be far easier than it ever has been in the past. If you want to put your own locomotives onto Transnet's currently managed rail network, that's something that we also are trying to make a lot easier. So the whole point here is that public part, uh, private partnerships and private sector partnerships and access to infrastructure becomes a whole lot easier for the country to do its business from a transport and logistics perspective. Um, and then finally, at the end of the day, between reducing bureaucracy and promoting organizational effectiveness, we still need to make sure that we build up the country and the skills inside of the country. So you will start to see some of the training platforms that we bring to the market and actually provide as services both inside of Transnet and to outside parties as part of the extension of that. So we're not just looking at making sure that our people are skilled, but that we can actually skill people involved in transport and logistics across the country as part of the initiatives that we build out in the next five years. I think that's all I've got time for, Harry. So I'm gonna leave the, leave the questions until the, the panel. I'm sure you've probably got a few. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and hopefully that was insightful to some degree. Thank you so much, Tony, um, ladies and gents. It's so exciting to hear about the leaner, efficient transnet, and we're looking forward to that in the future. Clearly, uh, my hairstyle is not a reflection of the amount of data you guys are collecting. But uh, really, that, that's, that's innovation, you know. I've learned innovation has got three or uh, four imperatives. The one is to, to be more effective in what you do. The other one is to be closer to your customer. The other one is to be disruptive. The other one is to be quick to market. And clearly, you guys are doing all of them. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you very much.
Right, we've got Dr. Roline Brunk, and she's going to talk about the impact of fourth industrial revolution on transportation modes. Thank you very much, Roline. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was asked by Dr. Nolin to talk about the impact of 4IR in transportation modes. I'm from an IT background, so I'm not, from, I'm not a specialist in uh, transportation. So I've looked at the different transportation modes of, um, and, and identify the top, four I, the top seven 4IR uh, transportation ways across the world. So I'm going to discuss that. Why is transportation and logistics starting? So my first questions, this is my questions from, from my IT perspective is, we need to remember that 4IR is here. It's here to stay. It's not going to disappear, people. It's here to stay. So we cannot deny the benefits of 4IR. And, and we need to, to look at the benefits and then work according to that. So the major challenges that we currently experience and face in the cities is just think of the highways that's currently closed. I'm driving myself from the West Rand to the DFC campus. It almost took me four hours. If, if I leave the campus on, on a Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock, then I will only arrive at home 7.30 at night. So what can we do to achieve that and to, to address the challenges? So the major challenges from my perspective is, the first one is the smog and the pollution, and then the traffic jams. The traffic jams, and, and we all have headaches with the taxis, am I right? <laughs> Terrible. So the first one is a picture on the, on the left-hand side. Oops. So now I don't know how you see technology. The center button. Okay, now. So if we look at this picture, you will see here is the traffic jams that we experience every day. So on the right-hand side is, is, is what we currently experience. And on the left-hand side, you will see are the technologies that, that I've identified for transportation that's already created. The first one is right at the top here. It's a very interesting one. Just imagine that is a transit elevated bus that can accommodate or, or uh, that can transport 1,200 passengers. Now imagine we have something like this in South Africa. Can you just imagine the, the traffic jams will be less, am I right? So this transit elevated bus um, is a high traffic bus and it's designed to circulate above the vehicles. So it's above the vehicles, two meters above the, the uh, vehicles and then the cars will drive underneath that. So the, the other one is in the middle here is the drones. The drones is not only used to, to transport passengers. They use drones to transport passengers. They use it for, uh, to deliver food for Mr. Delivery. So it's like the Uber delivery where you now have Uber Foods as well. So it seems to me Uber is with technology all over. Okay, then to address these major challenges, the other that I identify on the railway is um, currently on the railway and in the old industrial revolutions, we have the normal trains. The best one for me is the top one here on the left-hand side corner, referred to as a hyperloop. Now, a hyperloop is used as an electronic motor to accelerate the capsule you will see inside that tube, there is a capsule. And that capsule can carry tw 28 passengers. And what's wonderful about that, 
that is the, the speed is 1,200 kilometers per hour. So it means that instead of a flight uh, of an hour, uh, hour and 30 minutes flight, I can use this hyperloop and I can travel for 12 minutes. Then I will be at the same destination instead of using the airplane with the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop was designed uh, by our own Elon Musk and it was tested in uh, Nevada, in, in, in um, Vegas, as well as it was already tested in Dubai, between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And the flight between Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi is one hour and 30 minutes. And if you use the hyperlink, it was 12 minutes. Then we have the UltraPod here at the bottom. The UltraPod is already uh, used uh, at Heathrow Airport. Meaning what happened is instead of me arriving at London and trying to find a taxi or trying to find a shuttle, I will go and just type in my destination and request uh, UltraPod. And then within a minute, the, they will send me my UltraPod. And it's an autonomous vehicle and it will automatically take me to the hotel of where I want to be. The next one is a SkyTrain. A SkyTrain. And I think that will work wonderful for you, Jay. The reason why I'm saying that is if we need to move from one campus to another campus instead of sitting in traffic and be frustrated with the taxis around us and having road rage, we can just get onto the SkyTrain. The SkyTrain is, is a capsule and that capsule is seven meters from, 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 uh, from the ground and it can carry two people at a time. And, it, and the speed is 100 to 200 kilometers per hour. So meaning if I need to go to a meeting at the DFC campus, I don't need to stress about the traffic, I can just get on the SkyTrain and within minutes I will be at the Soweto campus. So that's the railway. The water, as you can see, the first picture there was the f many moons back. What happened now is they use um, the newest one is this water taxi on the right hand side. Can you see it's not even in, it, it, it walked like um, a car with wheels. So that's the water and they also use um, technology and self-driven um, instructions. The next one is the air, uh, the air transport. Now there is two important ones here on the side. Is how many people in this room would like to go to space? There are a couple of us who would like to go to space. This space plane uh, is designed to carry passengers up to a height of 110 kilometers, okay? And using a hybrid rocket and reach a speed of 42,000 kilometers per hour. Can you imagine, book yourself a flight and go into space? The other one is a modular airplane and this modular airplane, basically it's, it's a plane but it can also transport passengers uh, on boat as well as um, transport you um, on a train. So in other words, it means that you, you are on this plane, but if you want to go from the plane to a train, you basically stay in your seat and then from there go to the train. So it's just a modular, you can see the three modulars, there's three modulars. So it will just remove the modular and then it's on, on, on water or train. That's the seven that I've identified as the most 
uh, important ones that's developed for 4IR within the whole world. And it's already in the process of developing and some of them are already tested. But now what will the impact be for us if we have transport like that? First of all, we will reduce the smog and the pollution. There will be no traffic jams. That is just a dream. I wonder if it will ever come true. There will be less accidents. We don't need to, to have road roads with the taxis then that's driving reckless. We will have safer streets. And by the safer streets, what's happening in South Africa is, I don't know how many in the room knows about it, but there is what they call an automatic number plate recognition. It's more or less the same as the, um, the toll gates. So what happened is, in your community, if you drive, just have a look. There's cameras in your community. So they basically take your number plate, and if you drive reckless, then it's big data lying in the cloud somewhere, and they can use that information to find the people who was driving reckless. Even if there was, um, in the area, let's say there was a burglary, and they are looking for people, and that camera is there, then it will uh, enable the security people to identify the people w according to the number plates. So that's what's happening currently in South Africa. So, so have a look if you're driving around the community. You will see it's a, it, it looks like a big uh, pole with, with a round um, thing with the, with the cameras at the top. And that is basically tracing where you are going. So basically, Big Brother is watching all of us. It will also connect us faster. So if we have the Hyperloop in South Africa, it means I can stay in Cape Town where I want to stay and I can work in Johannesburg where the money are. So I didn't, don't need to worry to fly every day because it will be cheap and it will be fast. Uh, tr tracking the freight and the vehicles with the cameras, uh, self-driving cars and safer vehicles. And also, if you're driving under the influence, if you drive your vehicle under the influence, your cars will have sensors to measure the driver fatigue. I want to end my presentation with one um, video that I would like to show you. And if you're driving in, in, in traffic and there's emergency vehicles that needs to either go and take someone to the hospital or need to get to a house because there's a fire, then it's always an issue to, to get between the traffic. So this video will show you what technology can do for the fire vehicles, for example. So let me just find that and maybe put on my glasses. Okay, it's here.
And that's the future. Are we ready? I think we still have a long way as an emerging, developing country. But I think if we, if we work together, we can, we can achieve it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raleen. That is surely something to look forward to. Isn't this going to be ex exciting? Um, lots of research done, and we really appreciate your presentation. Um, now we're going to have the exciting time to engage with the panelists. So can we please have all our panelists to the front so that we can do the panel discussion? And uh, lots of fun doing that. We also invite the people following us online to post questions. Um, they can post questions by texting it onto the YouTube channel. And we'll see if we can address those questions as well. So we can please have our panelists to the front. Thank you very much. Right, we've got one panelist you might not know is Tracy. She's from Kuna and Nagel. She's standing in for Marcus. So thank you very much, Tracy. We've got Tony Willis, Transnet, Tracy, then Kuna and Nagel. We've got Raleen Brunk from UJ and Tony Thomas Neyman from Huawei. Um, ladies and gents, we're going to do the panel discussion now. So the rule of the game is that you ask a question, you put up your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. The camera at the front will zoom in on you because, as we said, we've got people online following. And then when you ask the question, please keep it short. Don't ask a lot of questions. Ask one question at a time. Identify yourself, who you are, what company you're representing. Ask your question. You can ask a question for the panel as a whole or direct it to one panelist. They've got pads in front of them. They can take notes. So we're going to take two or three questions. And then we'll give the panel opportunity to respond. And then at the end of the session, we'll give each panelist opportunity for closing remarks. So that's how we're going to do it. So please can I have an indication who wants to ask the first question. Uh, morning, uh, Mike Johnson from Transport Concepts. Uh, I've got a question for Tony. Um, one of your primary objectives, uh, I think you said, was reducing the cost of doing business. Now, I know there's been a lot of talk from, uh, from a government point of view and from an industry point of view that we really need to be more competitive by reducing our cost of doing business. Can I ask you in terms of your mandate, the one that you said, how you measure whether you're improving the cost of doing business, um, you know, how do you evaluate whether you're achieving that objective? And I'd also be interested to know whether that's from your point of view as Transnet or it's from the customer's point of view uh, in terms of his total sort of end-to-end -end supply chain. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next question. Afternoon. My name is Fiso Mangwele, city of Johannesburg, uh, responsible for ITS. Uh, I also have a question uh, for for Sneeman. Um Just a quick one around uh, cloud. And um, what what's the future plan of way around 
data centers in SA. Are you going to be developing any data centers here or you will be hosting overseas? Thank you for that question. I think there was one here to front as well. Olga? Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Olga Mashilo from Buleng Bontle Consultants. Uh, my question to Transnet. Uh, Tony, we, um, you indicated uh, the private sector uh, uh, partnership uh, within Transnet uh, while they are using your uh, infrastructure. I would like to find out uh, from you, uh, looking at uh, sometimes your terminals are fully booked and uh, your current clients are experiencing uh, uh, problems themselves. So what, uh, what is going to happen if a, 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 a private uh, company is uh, uh, in an agreement with you and they are using your terminals? How are we going to go about that? Uh, looking at the disruptions uh, within your, your human uh, uh, elements also whereby you have uh, your power failures, you have your uh, absent, uh, a lot of absent uh, uh, locomotive uh, drivers. Thank you, Olga. The panel can respond. Thank you. So let me start by uh, seeing that the first question was around the lowering cost of, of doing business. And th the mandate is very clear from a DPE perspective, that it's lowering the cost of business in relation to GDP, which doesn't necessarily answer the question that I think you'd like it to. Um, but I think we take, it, we take it beyond that. So it's not, that's just one of the indicators that we are required to, from a sh uh, shareholder compact perspective, meet. I think the, there's a greater um, obligation inside of Transnet, which is to lower the actual cost of doing business from a transport and logistics perspective across the country. And I think there, there are multiple aspects to that. One is obviously lowering the cost of Transnet's cost of business, so the cost of Transnet's day-to-day -day operations, which is part of where the action plans are going at the moment to actually drive that out. And to lower, if we lower our cost, we lower the cost of what we actually put on the table for you as the cost that we charge you for particular services. But I think there's also an optimization from an operations perspective which goes into that. And so when we start to bring together end-to-end -end services as opposed to having siloed services, the actual cost to you should be lower at the end of the day. And that's the, that's the goal, is to drop the actual cost for yourself as a transport and logistics user of Transnet services. So I think there's, there's a shareholder compact um, portion of the question and that we, we continually measure and that's GDP related, but there's a greater um, intent to significantly drop the cost of transport services that Transnet's providing. And I, I mean, I'll just give you one example of what, what will sound crazy, but is something that's happened in real life in the last week is somebody wants to transport um, some goods from Durban port to just outside Hoodsprate. In order to get to a particular point, 13 kilometers from the end point, will cost around about 5,000 rand a ton, right? However, if you actually give them the non-optimal view of what that would cost, and what was presented as an alternative to actually get to that endpoint via a completely different route, right? It's 15,000 rand a ton, right? There's the intelligence and analytics side of what we bring in in terms of optimizing, in terms of bringing in alternatives, in terms of defining end-to-end -end services that are optimal for what you're looking for, which may not, at the end of the day, just be rail-related or transport services-related. That's what we see as the customer centricity that we need to bring and lowering cost of doing business is that. So instead of giving you the 15,000 Rand option, we give you the 5,000 Rand option plus add to that the cost of moving something 13 kilometers from point A to point B. Total cost of that is significantly less than the 15,000. And that's where we start to get to bringing in the 
intelligence and optimization analytic side of planning, capacity management, etc. So I hope that answers some of the question. Um, but it's, it's a combination of technology, it's a combination of intelligence, it's a combination of integrated view across all of the services, not only those that Transnet currently provides, but what's required in order to deliver the customer-centric service. So hopefully that, that answers some of that question. Can I, can I go on to the third question and then come back to, to the cloud question just after that? So related to your, your point, and again, coming back to optimizing operations, right? Historically, we have not been good at optimizing operations across the board from an integrated perspective. So it's very difficult to get a view for getting goods from pit to port and having an integrated view as to which uh, crews are available for which trains, for which wagons, for which locomotives that actually have been maintained, and then making sure that the terminals are actually available and the people in the terminals are available, and actually there's not going to be a disruption because there's a strike or because of anything else. So again, f coming back to the impact of that integrated intelligence center, the integrated intelligence center is there specifically to start removing some of those barriers to customer service and to customer service levels in terms of what we provide um, in terms of end-to-end -end services. So capacity management, availability management, reliability management, end-to-end -end, um, deviation management. So if something happens at a particular point, right, what do I do to actually replace that? So do I bring in trucks to replace something that's been derailed? Those are part of the systems and solutions that we're busy building right now to actually solve some of those day-to-day -day issues that, that you're experiencing on the ground. It's not going to be flick of the switch tomorrow, but you will start to see dramatic improvements in that over the next six to 12 months. We've already got a number of um, intelligence centers being built out to actually start dealing with these exact issues that you're describing. So. I mean, we, we try to do the best we can, and we've got plans to make sure that those activities actually happen going forwards, and, and the technology is a major, major drive in being able to make that happen. So, Fusio, a question on the cloud side. Um, we will be hosting our own cloud environment in South Africa from a Huawei perspective. And that can be done by our own data centers, which locations are not available yet to disclose, or can be co-located with our strategic partners, uh, which we can share that infrastructure. The moment we have that information available, we can share it. Thank you, Tommy. Any comments from the other panelists this far? Thank you, next question. My name is Rugare, and I'm from The Real Bicycle Company. So my question would be for Dr. Brink. I'd just like to know, what do you think is the future of bicycles as a green form of transport in this fourth industrial revolution? Do you think they're going to be outmoded, or do you think they'll rise to the occasion and gain traction, so to speak? Very interesting question. Thank you for that. Hi, my name is Aleta, I'm from the Car Train. My question is to Mr. Willis. Uh, you mentioned that you're reducing, or part of the strategic direction, um, quote unquote, was that you, you're you trying to reduce the how you deal with bureaucratic um, situations, so to say. How do you didn't get into detail with it? How do you plan to, how do you do it, or how do you plan to do it, being a state-owned entity? And I assume that you also deal with other state-owned entity, which Coming from my experience, that's a little bit hard in terms of the red tape and bureaucratic. Thank you for that question. Yeah. All right, we'll look up to the back. Uber, let me. Uber put its architect. I think we've had a fascinating day. Thank you very much for organizing it. But in many ways, we, we've addressed the symptoms, but not necessarily the problem. And if I stand on anybody's toes, please forgive me. Don't we need to go and think out of the box and stop people coming into towns 
that we use this technology that we've been talking about to go and repopulate the country where we can live in the towns, we can work in the towns, we can use Regara's bicycles, and we can use the cloud to go and have a better quality of life, less pollution, and a happier nation all around. Thank you, Uwe. Right, we'll get to you guys just now. Let's give the panel opportunity to respond. The bicycles. I think what we will we will definitely see is I was looking at YouTube videos last night, specifically on transportation, and one of the YouTube videos was about bicycles. But the bicycle looked vast different from from what I'm used to when I grew up as a, as, as a child. So definitely they will, there will be bicycles, but it will be fourth industrial bicycles. So meaning that they will implement technology within the bicycles. Thank you, Rulin. Can I just respond to that question as well? For instance, in China, they use Alipay where you can go at any point, use your phone, Alipay, pick up a bicycle and go, and you stop at a place and you pay again, you pay the distance. So that facility is already available. Will it work in South Africa? That's another question. And I'll probably also just add on that is there's also some air purification devices in China that they've actually adapted onto bicycles. So um, pulling water out of moisture from the air. I'm not going to talk about bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to, to answer the question around bureaucracy, I think that there are two aspects to the bureauc bureaucracy problem. One is the bureaucracy problem that is self-inflicted, right? And the other one is the one that's actually not self-inflicted, inflicted on a majority of, of government and state-owned enterprises. So. Let's deal with the first one. So, so from a self-inflicted perspective, we absolutely acknowledge and we, we're getting rid of the fact that we seem to have duplicated bureaucratic red tape through the organization simply because it's currently structured like it is. All right? We've got a corporate center. We've got multiple operating divisions which to a large degree operate um, autonomously in terms of their own decision making and in a large number of cases actually have got duplicate of what's sitting in the corporate center. So we have been, and it's you know, part of the history, it's part of the legacy, we, we, we sit with that and that's what the, well, one of the things that we can eradicate because we have got control over that. And so that's part of the bureaucracy that we will eliminate and are busy eliminating as part of restructuring and restructuring design of the organization. The other part is the bureaucracy inflicted through particularly procurement and governance from a governmental perspective. And we are also addressing some of those issues by taking requests to government, to National Treasury, but not in isolation. So one of the things we're doing is we're working with SARS to actually jointly go and approach um, National Treasury for relief around certain activities that just don't make sense in the context of um, procurement and, and the bureaucracy that goes with that. So, for example, if, if I want to do a proof of concept on utilizing bicycles to move things between A and B as opposed to drones, um, if I want to do a POC with that, it could potentially take me months to go through the procurement exercise just to buy the bicycles or to find out of who the bicycle provider is. And that, you know, we're talking about something that could be less than 10,000 rand. So at certain levels, it makes no sense to go through the same bureaucratic red tape and to have the same governance in place for something that's potentially at 10,000 rand, that's something that's at 10 million or 10 billion rand. So the point is to actually put in place adaptive governance and the appropriate levels of governance for what the risk is and what's actually trying to be achieved at the end of the day. Quite often, if you look at PFMA, the fifth item of, uh, I think it's clause 51 of the PFMA Act, talks about cost effective, right? 
quite often we end up being totally cost ineffective because we're actually going through and trying to meet some of the other characteristics that PFMA puts in place. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, get, we shouldn't keep PFMA, but I think we need to adapt PFMA to appropriate levels for the risk that the organization, no matter which organization it is, is actually exposing the government fiscus to. So I think we're we ad we addressing both the self-inflicted bureaucracy problems and we actually in constant negotiations with National Treasury about how we optimize the governance controls that are inflicted from PFMA and other regulation. Thank you, Tony. Anything else from the other panelists? Not yet. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maledlabo Handel, um, and I'm from a company called Global Electric Vehicle Road Trip. Um, so we, we've um, uh, been sitting here listening to very exciting um, presentations um, and also elaborating on, you know, where we are going as um, um, the globe or um, as a nation. Um, but I, I wonder if we are actually thinking about um, as well, uh, maybe one of um, the pa panel members can be able to explain um, or give an opinion high level of um, if we have already been consider considering the macroeconomics um, impact that such introduction of, of these innovative technologies, what it, what it would do um, to the country's economy. Um, and I think most um, a, a relevant example is what Mr. Sneeman presented um, within uh, automated um, airport, what happens to these jobs that um, are already uh, giving people a life? What will happen then um, when we bring these um, innovation? Thank you, it was Ayans, yeah. Thanks, Harry. Uh, my name's Andrew Barker. I'm a town planner and development strategist. Um, I've got two points. Um, Tony, firstly, I'm involved with property development, um, looking to the future, obviously, from a property development point of view, uh, looking at rail services and systems, uh, commercial freight. Um, how can we help? And I think perhaps we need to have a cup of coffee sometime <laughs> because I think your ideas, and certainly we've had some fantastic presentations today, Harry, thank you, and seeing where things are going um, because I think it's important that and you're calling for that collaboration between private and public. And uh, I certainly have a client who'd be very interested to talk to you around that. Because <coughs> I think it's a critical thing that we start to look at that collaborative opportunity. And I believe that the fourth industrial revolution is starting to do that, in that your private sector, your communities, your state and your academia are able to get that communication process going a lot e more easily. Um, we have silos within each sector, never mind cross-sector, and I think it's critical we start to get that collaboration, the power of collaboration, actually working through co-design, and co-concept development and things like that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is, I understand the fifth revolution's knocking on the door. And when you listen to everybody today, we've talked data, and we've talked information, and we've talked intelligence, but we haven't taken the next step to knowledge. And I believe that is the next step that we've got to look at. Um, and I'd like your views on that, because what I'm seeing coming out of everything <coughs> today has been impersonal. It's lacked that human soul. Yes, it enables better decision making, but it's cold decision making. Somehow we've got to put the heart back in and get that knowledge factor coming through. And I think that to me is really where we're going to see the power of the fourth industrial revolution, the artificial intelligence and all of that cold stuff <coughs> start to get really hot and start to happen. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Andrew. We have more hands here. Let's take the last one this side. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to our hosts and sponsors for 
um, today's event. Um, my name is Mbulelo Mandindi. I'm a student here at UJ studying transport management, and my question is um, posed to Dr. Brink. Um, I just want to know, I understand that UJ um, has a keen interest in keeping abreast of um, all the changes relating to the fourth industrial revolution and informing <coughs> us students about these changes. But I think there's, there's a really important difference between um, sharing knowledge and receiving knowledge and translating that knowledge into a skill because the value doesn't lie in the knowledge itself. It lies in the ability of us students being able to translate that into a skill that is valuable. So over and above informing us about all these changes uh, brought on by the fourth industrial revolution, what is the university doing to embed within us the skills that we need in order to be able to leverage these emerging technologies? Thank you. Thank you. The panel can respond. We're running out of time, ladies and gents. I'm going to take a few questions there afterwards. And, uh, and then it will be the closure. So the panel can respond on these questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I will answer the question to the student on the fourth IR and UJ. And I can only speak from, from my department, department and school's uh, perspective. I don't know what transportation is doing. Maybe Dr. Nolin can inform us about that. But in the IT department, we have in the School of Consumers and Intelligence, we have the um, Technopreneur Lab, where we work closely with all our students, developing apps and developing uh, technology for the fourth industrial revolution. An example that I can mention is that one of our students done last year is we they take a picture of a mathematical problem and then the computer will automatically, that app will give the student step by step how to solve that problem. So our students are working in a technopreneurship lab. So we link our students with what's going on in technology outside. From a transportation management side, unfortunately, I can't answer that. Thank you, Rolin. The question, what is knowledge? Because I, I think everybody is sharing in knowledge. Uh, it was clearly stated this morning that Google is the encyclopedia of the world. And very interesting, some countries don't have, have, have access to Google. Uh, they're just using a different platform. I don't think that technology will take over the role of the people process. You have to manage it correctly. You cannot just go in there and just replace people with technology just for the sake of automation, efficiency, effectiveness, and all that. You have to have a, a, a good business case uh, based on principles and why you want to move to that way. And I think from, from our perspective is that we are demonstrating that we're using certain technology, we're using certain platforms to make the work improved. Uh, there will be casualties. If you look at what's happening in uh, Qatar on the airport, I think it's more effective. But it comes back to what are we providing to the end customer. I'm traveling on a regular basis overseas, and I'm so frustrated when I get to the airport and people using their cell phones and you can't get service. I would rather use a system and redeploy that people to other places and have the effective and efficiency of, of a system. So yes, that have to be with uh, union and the labor, but you cannot just go and replace everything with technology. You have to be a process. Thank you, Tommy. So uh, maybe answering the questions in reverse order. Um, <laughs> The, so, Andrew, thanks. I, I think we'll do breakfast and coffee. I think that certainly sounds worthwhile. Um, and we certainly are interested. And, I mean, we, we very much want to walk the talk. We, this, this is not just talk from our side. And I think coming back to um, the question around emotion, 
Um, funnily enough, one of my colleagues is actually writing a PhD on emotional bots in AI. So actually, how do you, act, how do you program emotion into the artificial intelligence ecosystem so that it isn't just pure uh, or raw data, there's actually emotion built into it so that any robot, whether it's um, you know, a physical robot or whether it's a, a technical um, piece of software, actually applies emotion eventually to that. And I think it will come, but I think it's still a way off. And certainly in talking to him, um, we're still a way off from having that level of output generated from what we currently have as analytics or intelligence or insight generating uh, technologies today. But I, I think it's coming. It's, it's certainly an area that's being studied, um, but I don't think it's going to be something that necessarily crops up next year or, or the year after. Um, in terms of the, the question around macro imp macroeconomic impact, um, I mean, going back to Klaus Schwab's book around the fourth industrial revolution, he does, he does very clearly identify in there that every generation of new technology introduces new jobs, but that the impact is not equivalent to the jobs that it's actually taking over. So unfortunately, the macroeconomic impact from a pure technology delivery from a fourth IR perspective is that there will be fewer jobs available than there are today. That's just the, the projection and it's the history and there doesn't seem to be anything to point in a different direction. However, I think there, what it does do is it places an, uh, an imperative on us to actually drive out what, again, we have as part of our shareholder compact, which is to drive the social development and the social and economic capability and sustainability capabilities of the country which means that they may not be directly in that particular area. There are lots of areas of this country which are under-resourced under in a number of areas, artisans being one of them, and we need to make sure that we take that into consideration as well, as well as enabling people to start being entrepreneurial, and that in its own right is fundamental. Um, you know, the, one of the keys to, to al allowing a future world to actually exist is to allow people to dictate their future, but by skilling them up and allowing them to be able to think and to operate for themselves, which means going through a particular education process, which doesn't need to have to be a formal degree, but it's actually an enabling of skills for people that currently don't have those skills and haven't been exposed to them. And so I think th there's a um, there's a fundamental requirement and obligation for us to start driving out that set of behaviors, which is not necessarily to do with today's jobs in transport and logistics per se, but is a bigger obligation from a, a country perspective. But the, the bottom line at the end of the day is you're never going to get away from the fact that new technology ultimately takes away more jobs than it generates, unfortunately. Thank you, Tony. Right, ladies and gents, we're going to do the last round of questions. Okay, that one there, that we've been waiting for a long time. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. The name is Adrian Breslin, I'm a transport engineer. I just wanted um, I think it's your third or uh, to the Transnet uh, chap, Tony. Um, I think it's your third or fourth uh, mandate, and that is to replace uh, the trucks on the road. And um, if we look at your your history, I think in the late 90s you were transporting a tremendous amount of uh, TEUs, um, and then your, the market fell out and taken over completely by the road hauliers. And I just uh, would like to know exactly what is in the action plan. And surely I get the impression that this particular mandate on the list of seven or whatever is way bad, way, ba way down. And um, I might be wrong, I might be too critical, um, but I 
just like to know how you know how you intend to to address that. Thank you very much. Um, this will go to translate as well. South Africa is a developing country. So currently, it seems to me that you guys are uh, transporting minerals largely, and SMMEs are said to be the driver um, of economic de development. What is your strategy towards that? How are you looking into SMMEs to get them to ship their goods in and around the country or outside? Uh, as well as, what are your future plans? Because whatever minerals that are taken out of South Africa, as soon as they get to the port, somebody from somewhere else picks them up and sends them to the world market, and we're losing them. Oh, sorry, I'm a former student of UJ as well. I studied transport. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gents, we're going to close the questions now. The lady at the front, my apologies. Can you guys take it offline? We seriously run out of time. So the panel can respond. Thank you. I think that means me. <laughs> okay. So did the person who asked the question just leave the room? <laughs> okay. So um, let's let's deal with the road to rail question. So the mandate's not to replace road with rail. So it's not to destroy the road industry, right? But it is to move a significant amount of road traffic onto rail. Historically, the reasons why we, we haven't done as much as we should have, and if we look at the, the actual numbers, we have increased the rail traffic over the last five to 10 years, but as a percentage of total traffic, it's actually declined. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and a lot of them are to do with reliability of the rail service. And certainly part of the action plan around the rail service is to change that behavior. And part of the introduction of the logistics into end services is actually to then take control of that particular ownership so that a particular um, logistics component actually controls the wagons, controls what wagons are there, controls whether they have been maintained, controls the whole aspect of the service delivery. So it goes away from today, which is a pretty, you know, again, a siloed approach where some of the technologies that we have in place haven't worked that well over the past while. So, for example, on some of our sensors and our IoT that's in place on our wagons. Um, they're only operational 10% of the time, right? which is just crazy in today's technology world. So there are significant changes that we're bringing about at a technology level to improve the availability of information and data, but also from a service level perspective to, to modify that behavior. We're also starting to, I think, uh, progress into different markets and are sort of now starting to answer some of the second question a little bit as well, which is, um, addressing market spaces that we haven't actually played in historically and that we haven't actually had a significant role in. And there's quite a lot of work happening in particular areas around um, agriculture um, in that particular space to bring some of that into, into the rail, off-road off and onto rail in particular areas, as well as um, answering the second question, which is there's a big push behind FMCG and container-based delivery, where if you look at the percentage of business that we have, it's about 20% of the market, whereas from a minerals perspective, we up at sort of 80, 90% of the market. So there's a significant push to deliver services in fast-moving consumer goods and containers that actually allows SMMEs and, and other players, not just the, the mining sector, to actually leverage uh, the rail infrastructure that we have today. I hope that answers some of the question. Thank you, Tony. Maybe some closing comments from Transnet's perspective? Sure. I think I've said enough, haven't I? <laughs> um, no, I, I think, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And, and I think thanks for the questions, because I think the questions actually are always useful in getting a, another viewpoint as to what we need to do better and what's being experienced out in the marketplace. So I, I think just thanks to, to everybody for the questions. Um, I think at the, at the end of the day, 
we are going through a massive transition as an organization, all right? Yes, we've got a history and, you know, you don't, if you read City Press or Sunday Times or anything else on a weekly basis, we've come through a torrid five to seven, eight year period, all right? We, there's no doubt that there was significant corruption inside of the organization. Um, it's, it's been rooted out. It is being absolutely... Um, attacked from all sides by our new board and by Exco. So uh, there's a totally new mindset that, and, a, and a, almost a start of a new culture that's starting to take place inside of Transnet, which is very different to um, some of what was there two years ago, five years ago. And I think that in its own right will start to show as we bring in new sets of services, new thinking, but just a different way of dealing with the government's money at the end of the day. So I think you know, that's, that's something that is very different. You know, a lot of my friends say, well, what, you, you're working at Transnet. Um, but it's a, it's a very different experience walking into Transnet today to walking into Transnet two, three years ago. Um, and that whole culture change and the, the change to the business as a whole, I think, will start to bear fruit quite soon and people will start to see a, a different and, and hopefully get a different experience. Thank you, Transnet. So I think from a freight forwarding point of view, and I can only give my sort of personal opinion and professional opinion based off Middle East and Africa, um, I think the differentiator between ourselves and the ability to play with technology far outweighs what your capability as a state-owned enterprise would be, right? The beauty of that is it actually allows us to pick up between the gaps where a state-owned enterprise may have difficulty, fix the problem and solution, and then have you as an offtake somewhere along the value chain. Um, I think being underpinned by technology enforces that collaboration. It already is in play. It's not as though it doesn't exist. Um, to the SME questions, there are fellow entrepreneurs who have birthed disruptive intermodal platforms that are really allow for inclusion to move your trade and your products. These things exist. I think what happens in the space is that there isn't a lot of um, information sharing or technology sharing about what these platforms are that could bridge these gaps um, and get everyone to market because ultimately that's what we're all trying to do is enable trade, facilitate trade, capture ecosystems, draw out the, the monetary value out of data, improve efficiencies, get the nearest, most cheapest, dirtiest rate you can give to beat the competition. Um, I think from a, a legacy freight forwarder point of view, we stand in a very, very opportunistic world where we can actually just turn in any direction. We don't have to be a core freight forwarder anymore. We can think like a bank. We can move into trade finance. We can do all these things. So I think from a freight forwarding point of view, you'll see a lot of shifting in terms of core business areas. You'll see a lot more of those asset light models that we spoke about or Marcus, my MD, spoke about earlier on where really we just become the marketing enabler connectors to marketplaces. Thank you, Kuna Nahal. UJ. From an academic point of view, I think that 4IR is here and we need to start working together and collaborate as an academic unit with the industry and the students and connect the three together as well as uh, we need to start thinking out of the box. It's not business like 30 years back, it's business in another sense of the way. We also, fourth IR, will create jobs. Yes, some of the jobs will no longer be there, but fourth IR will create new jobs, different jobs, technology. We need to implement technology in any facet of all types of industries, and transport is one of them. Thank you, UJ. Huawei. I think IR4 is here to stay. That's happening. It's not, that's not a dream. And don't be afraid of it. Uh, let's take the road. Let's take the journey. 
and let's uh, assist with that journey to make it successful as long as the end user is benefiting from it. And from a government perspective, there must be a political and administrative will to participate in this process. As long as there is a denial that IR4 is existing, uh, we will not get to the end goal at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Huawei. A few words perhaps from our host today? Nothing. Let's give our panel a hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gents, you can stay where you are because we're going into the new short exercise. But it's on this stage you'll be saying goodbye to our online viewers. Thank you much, very much for following us online. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again next week, Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll be going to talk about road funding and we're going to get feedback from the operators. So thank you very much for joining in. Goodbye. Ladies and gents, we're going to send around the, the lucky drop box.